Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah, baby. As usual, if you'd like to support this channel, there are PayPal and Patreon links in the info box below. Welcome to Ball Busters, episode 128, 128, baby. We're going to kill the globe tart again.
this is for all the can't fog a This is gonna this is gonna make your line straight. <laughs> Let's head it on over to Discord. This thing was Nathan Oakley. Nathan Oakley, sir, go. Go? Well, how <laughs> polite of you. It's nice to be here, too. Go. <laughs> ah. Damn, fired up, man. <laughs> Just fired up and fired up all morning. I gave you permission to start while we were doing the intro. I said, you may begin. Ah, I didn't see that. I didn't hear it either. I just weren't paying attention. Telepathically, I sent it to you too. Telepathically. No... <laughs> yeah. I, I don't get telepathic messages. You're just not looking. <laughs> You're just not vigilant enough. Nah, uh, my, my every wind of doctrine deflector shields are up. <laughs> uh, now we're in this show, and we talk about what we're talking about on today's show. Or is it still a secret? Um... I think it's still a secret. I've been pushing it. It's an absolute secret until the time comes. <laughs> until the time comes. I see. Yeah. So even though people are here, they may have heard my appeals and calls to action to be here. I don't know how many people are watching. I'm not paying attention. Um, Hopefully a lot. 44 show, right now. No, no mentioning until after the third presentation. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, a resident true author is trying to ruin us. A resident uh, true author, he's, he's, he's trying to cause the shit out of this. Yeah, manipulate it from the inside. Strictly an in joke, so very bad form. You need to explain what you mean when you call me a true author to the audience <laughs> so they get the joke. Uh, absolutely, I I absolutely want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you I, I literally have been waiting Lies. days to do it. So. When Nathan has been asked a couple of times on his OME TV videos, are you a flat earther? His response is, well, it's measured flat. Now, that's not a yes or no answer, is it? No, it's not a yes or no yes. answer. Yeah, so it's that. And so that's why Nathan is now a resident true earther. <laughs> because yeah. it's a very simple yes or no answer. I mean, uh, 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 QE, uh, would you ask me the question, uh, do I own a cow? Do you own a car? Well, it, it is good to own a car. Now, that's <laughs> not answering your question, is it? Right? That's not a simple yes or no whether I own a car or not. <laughs> and that's true work that behavior. If you say so. so. Depending on the context, sometimes I don't want to be a flat earther. That's because flat earthers are considered the scum of the earth, stupid idiots that are here to scam people, fraud people. Furthermore, flat earthers are considered, as you're describing me, as the people out there punting things like true earth, people who believe in ice walls and domes. These are the kind of people that are labelled as flat earthers. Now, I don't know if there's anything favourable on the list I just gave. I want no association with any of that. Now, in Omi TV, if I answer too quickly, yeah, if I just say yes... There is a reasonable chance that they'll just put the phone down, metaphorically speaking. I know it's a video call. But metaphorically, they'll put the phone down on me. Now, if I'm a little bit ambiguous, it's not because I'm in any way, in any doubt, about the nature of our reality, which is flat. Now, ipso facto, there you go, Kiwi, I am a flat earther. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about that. I understand and appreciate how the earth is measured. Ergo, I am a flat earther. But I just don't necessarily say it when I've got a fish on the hook. That's all that is. Brian oh, wants to read into it oh, that somehow I'm now his oh, mortal earth enemy. Right, Brian, what, what's happened here? Has is, is, is Nathan been doing a St. Peter? He's been doing a, a flat earth Dave there. Um, or sorry, true earth Dave. True earth Dave. Because Dave would say the same kind of nonsense as the why he didn't answer yes to the question, do you know for sure and without a doubt? That the, that the earth is flat when Jesse Lee Peterson was asking him. Like, there's no getting out of this, Nathan. Right? Either you are, or as QE says, or you ain't. Is you is or is you ain't a flat earther? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't care what people think. I'm just going to go, yes, absolutely. And if they want proof, I'll give it to them. 
I don't care whether people think what oh they might think I'm this or they might associate me with that. I can deal with any of that, but I'd rather have my dignity. Damn, it's got nothing to do with having yeah. dignity. Dignity, <laughs> everything. <now. laughs> There's a certain level of ambiguity when you're in a back and forth discussion with a total stranger. You have to gauge. Now, let's put it this way. On one of those same Omi TV videos, I'm talking to a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. Very, very young Jehovah's Witnesses. Two girls. And these two girls are chatting away quite happily until Adam pipes up and says, Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the globe too. And they instantly, and I'm not even joking, instantly put the phone down. There's a very delicate balance that has to be struck. It reminds me of when SE Montreal was critical of me being overly harsh with one of my opponents. It's recently happened. That wasn't SE Montreal. That was Rebel. It was who? Rebel, not SE Montreal. Rebel. Ah, yes. I got it wrong last time I gave this. Thank you, Brian. Yes, it was. It was Rebel. He came in and he was ripping me a new one telling me how disgusting I am for my behaviour that was less than favourable, let's just say. And I said, look, in the pressure of the moment, sometimes you do these things, and the discussion's gone on for 45 minutes with the guy obfuscating left and right. He's got his white knights there rumpusing me at the right moments to cause me frustration, and eventually I am getting frustrated. You can't help it. You're a person. He wouldn't have it. Until he went on to a show and engaged in exactly the same scenario... Before he knew it, he's effing and blinding at the guy and he can't help himself. And he came back and apologised. Literally, he's like, I gave you a hard time because it seems so easy when you're just listening to the opponent to just say, well, just keep you cool. Like, are you trying to keep track of their complete lies, their obfuscations to date, pointing out to the audience that they're obfuscating whilst still trying to summarise a point that hasn't been concluded yet because you're in this rigmarole and you're expected to just keep you cool completely. Like, well, sometimes that's not possible. So, in that regard, it's a delicate balance. And this reminds me of that. If you engage in some random stranger discussion and manage to get a person chatting or at least listening to what you've got to say, all that's in the back of my mind is when can I get to the point where I can tell this person that Earth is flat and outer space, the sky vacuum, is fake? How can I get this conversation to that point? That's it. Now, if in the middle of it, they go, are you a flat earther? I think I've got to be very careful about how I answer this. Yes, I absolutely am. And do I want to scream it at them? Yeah, but I also want to make a successful video. So it's a delicate balance. I don't mind being called the true earther. I know it's all in good fun. Um, I'm not. If I was asked 20 times or 22, I think the count was with Jesse Peterson and David Weiss, if I know for sure and without a doubt that the earth is flat, I'll say yes. That's how it's measured. Like I have done in other videos, Brian's taken one in isolation for humorous effect, I'm sure. No, I, I only need to be asked one time. Like, uh, uh, people I, get a yes. I, I'll tell you so, what. I'll tell you what, Brian. I'd have to do, because, ladies and gentlemen, this conversation happened behind closed doors the other day, the exact same conversation. It went the exact same way, uh, except for the fact that, Nathan, that was a very compelling defense, if I must say so. It was the same defence I gave last time. It got total hand wave dismissal last time. Again, yeah. In private. And you get it now as well because it's a big a red herring away from the fact, from the point. <laughs> it's like, you were asked, you didn't give a yes or no. That's it. Sometimes there's a grey area. Not with me. <laughs> Not with you. If just I'm hand waving all of that nonsense. Well, you see, you have to oh, take in see. people's feelings and, uh, you know what I mean, their emotions on the day. You know? Nah. Just, uh, are you a flat earther? Yes. Yeah, but I can, I can see his case, though, Brian. Uh, he, he makes a compelling case here. In context, I think I'm going to have to side with him here. The context <laughs> of Jesse Peterson asking Brian, do you know for sure and without a doubt that the earth is flat? There isn't a single person on this panel that wouldn't just say yes. Being asked 22 times and not saying yes is obviously going to compel us to make reactions. But in this instance, me being asked by someone I'm trying to get on my hook in my OMI video that's a complete stranger and a nobody in terms of the context of this, you know, Jesse Peterson versus David Weiss, this is some rando. So it's not the same. No offence. So you're more like Bev then? 
Ben David was. Because Ben thought we were going to flat. Take, he's going to take it to the other extreme, see if this sticks. <laughs> because yes, Ben yes, thinks that's true. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> basically, I'm a denier of flat earth. I basically think that it's a very big ball, just like David Weiss. Hope you're happy. Not really, no. But we'll continue on. <laughs> flat. It's measured flat. But the problem with David Weiss, and this is just as stated, he does not know for sure and without a doubt that the Earth is flat. People on, in that camp don't because they stopped researching about 2017. That's why. Now, we have had the humility, Brian less so, because he was always of the opinion that he knew from day one and was a, just such a brain box that he didn't need to do any more research. And he was only it's affirming... It's not about me or attacking me or trying to assassinate my validity. This is about your validity. It's you. Not about Brian's validity. <laughs> no, <Most laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I tried to flip it back. It obviously didn't work. In either event, there's a, there's a whole camp of flat earthers that don't know, do they? I know it's flat, so I can take this in the good humour that it's supposed to be in, because no one's going to be able to challenge me on what I know. And if someone wants to ask me, do I know for sure and without a doubt Earth is flat? Yes, I do. No, for sure and without a doubt that the Earth is flat, because I do. There's no question in me internally, even though know, this little jape's going on as it is because of a way I've talked to a, a third a third party. They don't, do they? That's the that's the real talking point here. There are flat earthers that don't know it's flat. We do. If Adam has something to say, I get out of his way, and I, and I have something else maybe later on. after Adam. A couple of points. Um, I'm, I'm going to side with QE. Sounds like Nathan's an encyclopedia salesman. You knock at the door and they go, "Are you selling encyclopedias?" Well, you know, what my real purpose here is, is to kind of educate you. If you respond with, yes, I'm an encyclopedia salesman, you, you, you get the door shut in your face. So I can understand the approach. So, um, I oh, I, I, you've just reminded me of where I've got this skill from. This is from cold calling. So when I was an estate agent and a recruitment consultant, those jobs involved a lot of cold calling because you're trying to drum up business. And the person on the other end of that call is either somebody that you want to talk to that doesn't want to talk to you because they've got all the things that they need or a gatekeeper, that's a receptionist, that doesn't want to put you through to the HR department that you want to talk to to see if you can give them staff. Yeah, Same applies with the public with houses. Are you an estate agent calling me because you want to tell me about a house you've got? No, I'm actually more interested in finding out what you need in your design desires for a house and i'm snickering because that's total bullshit i don't care what you want for a house i've got this house and i want to show it you <laughs> me telling you that i need to know what you need it's just a it's a ruse it's a lie same when no same principal recruitment and estate agency or do you guys call it real estate real realtor i forget i think that's the title in the states anyway estate agent here very very similar jobs so are you just trying to sell me staff I need to know what your desires as a company are, how you're looking to grow. I want to know about your business. Do I? Hell, <laughs> I don't. Do you have a requirement for a receptionist? One's just walked through the door that's highly qualified and I want to put her in a job. Have you got one or not? Is what I actually want to say. Yes, I know it's flat. Of course it bloody is, you idiot. I think you're a stupid idiot who thinks he's on a ball and I actually look down on you as being thick. I, but I, oh, they've gone. Because <laughs> that's what they'll hear. Well, unless Adam has something to add to that or respond to it, because he asked you it, or he brought it up. Yeah, not on this point. Yeah, and you cut him well, right off. All right, did you finish the point? Uh, and by the way, your mic sounds enchanting. Well, thank That's you. Thank you. How not about my mic. Yeah, not yours, and not yours, Brian. We'll get and we'll get to you here in a second. <laughs> we'll we'll get to you here in a second, there, Neil. My. It, that, Brian, you sound like you're like in, at the Philharmonic. Uh, only briefly. I just have to, just where I am, just as a bit of an echo in this room. But I'll be moving out of this room in a minute. All right. wrong with him having a little bit of God in his voice for today's presentation? Uh -huh. Well, 
what I would like to say to Nathan before the whole thing finishes um, and we move on from that topic is that Nathan is the person who always says, aren't you, that people behave different in real life when they're speaking to someone and they're looking at them. Now, even though you're not actually standing there talking to those people, you are there talking to strangers and you can see each other and you are behaving different. I can't actually see them. I'm looking down my camera. <laughs> <laughs> a monster's off to one side so when I'm actually look, when it looks like I'm looking them in the eye I'm not I'm staring at a 4k Logitech Brio well that makes all the difference anyway. in the world better than looking down the barrel of a gun you're missing my I point I had another point to I'll introduce do, uh, Neil let me just make this tiny point then Adam can go the point is that the impression you get from a video it's contrived and orchestrated to give you that impression that I'm connecting with them because I'm looking at you through the camera. To achieve that, I've got to look at the camera, though, which means I'm not actually as interactive with them as it may seem. It's contrived. But that just aids my defence. Anyway, Adam, go ahead. There was um, a point somebody Brian mentioned, Bev. Um, Neil... Neil... I think stuck it in Master B, but I'd noticed it before. Neil said he's he, he, we, we're living in his head rent free. I, I took it the other way, Neil. Maybe you'll respond, but I took it. Wow, we've been saying these things, and they're getting out there, and it looks like people are using that as an argument. And that is this argument that you're taking to people, uh, Nathan, which is the title of Bev's video last night, which is "Do you know you have a religion?" So shout out, Bev, for. Carrying the fight. Good lad. Didn't know he was doing that. Is he Is he uh, suggesting, particularly when Bev does things uh, like this on the table, it looks like, oh, well, look, he's carrying the flag for us. And then he gets in there and claims that us telling people that they've got a religion is a religion or something similar like that. That's Bev's typical shtick. And Brian? I thought, well, I, I, just want to say, I, 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 I thought agree. Neil... Um, I thought Neil was, this was directed at Neil. He was supposed to respond. Did I miss anything? Oh, brother. This is obviously the entire last conversation. No, Go I ahead, mean Brian. Brian's big Go, shaban. Go, Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. See, I called yeah. that right, didn't I? You called yeah, that you right. Did. Yeah, I listened to a couple of minutes of it, and I just I could only give it a few minutes. I, I just I didn't really know where he was going. Um, I think it was more in the direction as you said, Nathan, where he's saying that if you're saying people have a religion, they're being maybe a hippie, hypocritical, something like that. As you have a religion, something like that. That was what I got for the first few minutes. Now Adam might have watched more of it. I don't know. I may be a monk, but that was what I got for the first few minutes. And it's not why I used to watch Bev's show. Like, that's not the reason why I used to watch him. Uh, so I kind of, I just didn't, no, I, I just turned it off because I'm not really interested. I didn't watch any of it, Brian. I saw the title. Yeah, uh, if I can just say something there. I w <laughs> yeah, just yeah, say just... it right over top of Adam. Yeah. Go on. Look <laughs> ahead. Go ahead, Jim. We both spoke around about the same time. Sorry about that, but um, Adam, I was just going to say I agree with Brian, and I am really sick with all this uh, in 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 community fight. There is no community calling us a religion and things like that. We don't leave that kind of. There is no community. He's not part really. of the community, and I don't really watch Bev stuff. At He's all not part of the day. community, so we don't have. Yeah. Concern okay, about that. fine. I agree. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Oh, thank you for talking straight through Jin's point also, Kimi. It's Go my ahead, show. Forgive me, it's our show. Indeedy. Indeedy. You were co-hosting the shit out of you there, Jin. Oh, Adam, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm wrong then. I, I, like I said, I didn't watch any of it. I saw the title, um, and maybe my comment was a little in cheek um if that's the case then then neil's correct he nathan is living in his head rent free if the purpose of his show is not to talk to normies and introduce them to flat earth it's to critique nathan's technique and try and ridicule that that's 
that's what his show's about then. It's about Nathan, not Flat Earth. Oh, you... Oh my God! He's a O'Neill. That's absolutely spot on. Summary. You couldn't script that, could you? You couldn't be like. <laughs> Mike, check. Yeah, we all Mike, are. It's we horrible. We're all living in a lot of people's right, heads at the moment. <laughs> it's it's every it's every time. Now, know. Brian, well, to be and honest, Adam, sorry. Now, all three of us, right, all at once. Yeah, go. go. A couple people told me that I was a little harsh on Neil for this, but I'll tell you what, I don't think I'm harsh enough. Go on. I agree. My mic sucks. You sound great. Carry yeah, on. Yeah, he sounds great right now, but the next sentence is going to be garbled and robot. It's going to be in it. Do it, Neil. Do it. Do it, Neil. So what I was saying was, I listened to Bev, and all he's doing is taking a piss out of Nathan. Well, that came through clear. Kind of ruined my but point. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's happening to Neil is that, and Neil can correct me if I'm wrong, is that when the Bluetooth that he's using is switching over from his phone to his car, one of those is messing up either the car or the phone or something. So he's coming through clear when he's just on his phone or just in the car, but he's not coming through clear when he's not in the car or just on his phone. Something like that, because he's probably walking. It's truly, truly fascinating. Yes, yeah, I'm in an airport. Today's show, <laughs> we're talking about people living rent-free. Um, Brian and Adam today are going to get a few, you know, they're going to become house guests in a few people's heads today. Make made, made no oh, mistake. Yes. What, what the hell am I? Chop liver? <laughs> you can't. As, as a modest host of the show, you alleviate the credit to those around you. There is That's no credit. I, I'm part of this. I'm one third of this presentation, for God's sake. You're right. What do you mean, one third? One third. Mm. I'm going to present. Adam's going to present. Quarter. Shut up. I'm going to present. Adam's going to present, and then Brian's going to present. You see, in thirds, has the penny, penny finally dropped? I'm just I'm just not even involved, basically, am I? I'm just chopped liver. <laughs> no, you're, you're, co-hosting. You're, you're co-hosting the shit out of this. Right. So I take at least two-thirds of the credit. <laughs> totally reasonable. <laughs> you, you know what, Nathan? Again, it's oh, completely ruined by that. Right, and in all sincerity, right, just be, so it doesn't get interrupted again. Huey, specifically, and Brian and Adam will be living in people's head rent free at the end of this show. It's going to generate a lot of comments. It's going to live in their brains from this point forth, and I can't wait. Because, yeah, at the moment, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just because Omi TV's picked up a bit of popularity, therefore people go, I'll just pick fault in it. FRL Neg Nathan, in this case, Bev. So what? I don't care. My focus is on doing new stuff like that rather than talking about what Bleeding Bev's doing. And it's tedious. So this, what we'll be doing today, do you notice I used we? <laughs> what we will be doing here today will be living in people's head rent-free. But as, if I was to ascribe a specific individual or two to it, I think it would be Brian and Adam. But, I mean, we'll see. Time will tell. <laughs> No, it is a three-way presentation. Uh, it is all three of us, because we've all three of us have attacked this very issue right, separately for years. Right? And we've all used this very argument, but in three different ways for years. Me and Adam are similar. I do use and would use the way QE does it as well. I'm not saying that, like, that no problem with that either. Because QE does it the correct way, not the not not like other people who try to do it that way and don't do it the correct way. But it's the coup de gras, as you say, is that that's correct? Uh, QE yes. at the yep. very end. That's the part. And there's actually a special bit after that, actually, a special bit after that that brings us right up to the present day. Yeah, yeah, please that. share the show if you haven't done so already. I know I know we've said it in jest and haven't really told you what we're going to be doing. 
yeah, share the show. Make sure this gets out far and wide so you won't regret it. There's a few times when I already know in advance my shows are going to be good because we've already recorded them. This is one of those times because I've been in the rehearsal, know what's coming. It's quite exciting. So please share the show if you haven't done so already. Smash the share button. Stick it on Facebook manually if you have to do so. Just whatever means it is that you've got to get the show out so that it's got at least a decent live audience. And that will obviously subsequently affect the overall views as it goes forward in time. So please share the show. Just a couple of admin things before we get things going. Oh, they're silent admin uh, things. I was doing them in the background. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I keep the conversation going. The, Nathan, the reason I stopped listening to Bev was not anything personal with him because I used to really enjoy his show and enjoy uh, the way he used to hold the, I'd say he used to because I, I don't know if he still does hold a ball or to task on geometry and different things. The reason I stopped watching his show is because it become, became every episode became an some issue about you. And it got really boring. It's like, just do what <laughs> you do best and never mind Nathan. Are you saying just do Nathan, what you do best. Are you saying Nathan's yeah. boring? No, but if, no, no, not, oh. obviously not. Oh, it's just thought, that, but, forgive me. I thought that this, well, that's what, where it was at. Sorry. Please continue. <laughs> it's coverage of me is boring. It's continual attack. It's like if someone can only have something negative to say, then it means that they don't. It's not a bad. Like if someone wants to cover you every day, then they've got to cover you or anyone else uh, balanced. You know what I mean? If I have to cover what Bev does on his show every day, then there'll be certain things that I will go, I don't agree with that, or I'll say this is wrong, or whatever. But there's going to be things that I'm going to agree with and say, yes, I agree with this. That's correct. Blah, blah, blah. But it seems to me from the last three times I listened to Bev, now, I haven't listened to him for a long time, but the last three times I did, uh, including the video, that's including the video that Neil shared last night, it seemed to me that it was just all negative. There was nothing, yeah. there was literally no positive at, at any point. And that's kind of the way, why things have gone kind of sideways with Bev. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. I, I would like to, to cease and desist on Bevtard on this show. I don't want to really talk about him anymore, if you don't mind. No, I was just I, keeping conversation going because you said you were there. I meant to be. Uh, my, my admin was silent. Was my admin was silent, number one. I forgot to tell everyone. And <laughs> it was only for like five seconds did get the telepathic message in regards to the silent admin. It's just Brian took over and carried on talking about Bev in spite of the pre rehearsal <laughs> where we made it explicitly clear we didn't want to do that. But it's just, it's just in a belligerent mood, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll shut up about just, it. Just, <laughs> all right, just all to right. pull it back, guys, just, just to pull it back. You've, we've critiqued Nathan and not just openly screaming, um, I am a flat earther straight away when he's engaging with Brand. Don't trail off. Yeah. Don't trail off, Adam. Belly up to that Sorry. damn thing and stay there. What what I would like to say, it, it's garnered comment from Bev, this. Okay, which is, a, and kudos to Nathan. It's a great technique to take to a, a normie, yeah? Do you know you're actually part of a religion? It's actually a great way of starting to engage in a conversation. Um. It's worthy of merit, and so much so, like I said, Bev's noticed it and felt the need to comment on it on his Nathan Oakley comment channel. Who cares? I don't, uh, that's I... enough talk about me. Yeah. Let's talk about me. What do you think about me? Put your comments below. <laughs> yeah. I'll be going through those for the next five days. All right. It's like gonna... a flat earth belly of Alice. Okay. We're going to. Tell, that is ironic you said that because before the show, I brought up Kelly's Heroes. I was watching clips from Kelly's Heroes from Oddball, right? And Telly Savalas jumped on there. I can't believe you said that. I, I, it's just irony. Everything's coming together. <laughs> if you never watch Kelly's Heroes, folks, let me just tell you, it's a treat. So, go get that movie. Sit down and get the popcorn out. It's classic. Now, moving on to the whole point of today. 
we're going to head back down memory lane to the folks in Discord. Just hit the live one. You'll, you'll jettison yourself right into this. Like I said, we're going to head down memory lane here and go to an argument that I established after I nicked it off Eric Dubay. I think it was, since I came out here the 15th of May, I know the exact day, by the way, the 15th of May, I would say I had this argument completed the next day. I didn't present on it till a few days later. So I would say by the 18th, May 18th, 2016, this 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 was all mine. I took it as uh, you know, took it as my own. Uh, expanded on it, did all the calculations and formulated it. Yeah, it's this argument, folks. It's coming up to you right now. Hopefully, is is my did my mouse die again? We're good. Although you believe that Ryan actually talked about it on Flat Earth Debate a couple of weeks before that. Could no. be wrong. Now, Flat Earth Debate, I don't think existed at this time. Did not? Oh, okay, well, that joke then bombed. Yeah, I don't think it did. When did you start? What was what was the date for Flat Earth Debate number one? I don't know what day it is today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it, it it had started yet officially, but we're gonna go into flight. Yes, yes, yes. My second argument, the first argument that I had was the Bolivian salt flats. That was the same day I came out here. I established that argument, but that's for another day. Now we're into flight. Now I'll tell you what, this is gonna leave a mark. Technically, you globe tards are going to flatline. But, as I said before, everyone knows this intuitively that's ever flown on a plane before. And the ending of this presentation is for the Kent Fogamirians. And those are for the globe tards because flat earthers have known this since the beginning. Let's get into it. Since the Earth is, as we're told, a sphere tard, 25,000 miles in circumference, radius 39, 59 miles, then pilots traveling for one hour at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles an hour to simply maintain altitude would constantly have to adjust their altitude downwards, you know, to compensate for the curvature. You know, that little thing? way down there on the surface, remember that? And descend on average 2,789 feet every minute. Now, to negotiate the drop, I really don't care. The plane can barrel roll, split S, wing over, tail slide, slow roll, Cuban eight, falling leaf, the chandelier, or the hokey pokey, but that monkey must descend. Here's the most important point of this. Everyone ready? And everyone on the plane will know it. That's the rub. Yeah. Is this clear, Spurfers? Let's do a couple examples. A. How many miles of vertical drop that's geometric must be negotiated over a distance of 500 miles on a ball with a circumference of 25,000 miles? The answer is 31.7 miles. How many feet are in 31.7 miles, you may ask? Answer, 167,376 feet. So... 167,376 feet of vertical drop must be negotiated over 500 miles on the Earth as a globe tart. Number one, real world example. I'm traveling by commercial plane from the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers to Atlanta, Georgia for the Super Bowl. Approximate distance 500 miles. Two. 
the typical cruising speed, as mentioned above, is 500 miles an hour. This is where it gets tricky. So 500 miles distance at 500 miles per hour equals a travel time of one hour. I know that's difficult for you baltards. Just ask your slobber nurses. But for every, everyone else, that we can still follow. So, question. How many feet of vertical drop per minute on average needs to be negotiated on my trip if it were a ball tart b total feet vertical drop over 500 miles is 167,376 feet travel time is one hour it's a simple calculation right 167,376 feet divided by 60 minutes so the answer is 2,789.6 feet of vertical drop per minute on average must be negotiated by that plane on my trip. Does this happen? No. The sphere is a stone cold fairy tale. I can end it right here. Anyone that can fog a mirror that has ridden on a plane for one hour knows this as absolute fact period end of story there's no get out of incoherent jail free card okay no gravity pulling the plane down none of that nonsense it's over now for my second example this is going to become quite ironic if i must say irony is thick through the air today for mr tully savalas over there thank you adam so we might as well just keep it on, keep it on. Remember this. We're going to come back to it. B, how many miles of vertical drop, that's geometric, must be negotiated over a distance of 1,000 miles on a baltard with a circumference of 25,000 miles? Answer, 128.3 miles. Well, how many feet are in 128.3 miles, you may ask? Answer, 677,424 feet. So, 677,424 feet of vertical drop must be negotiated over 1,000 miles on the Earth. Real world example, number one, I'm traveling by commercial plane from the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers to Dallas, Texas. Approximate distance, 1,000 miles. Typical cruising speed, 500 miles an hour. A 1,000 mile distance at 500 miles per hour equals a travel time of two hours and 100, that's 120 minutes. So question, how many feet of vertical drop per minute on average needs to be negotiated on my trip? Total feet of vertical drop, as mentioned above, over 1,000 miles equals 677,424 feet. Travel time is two hours. Simple calculation again. 677,424 feet divided by 120 minutes. The answer to this question is 5,645 feet of vertical drop. That's over a mile, friends. Per minute, on average, must be negotiated by the plane on my trip. Does that ever happen? No, it doesn't. Let's fit it into a modus tollens for you. If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. If commercial planes travel at 500 miles an hour for two hours, that's 1,000 miles, over a sphere tard with a radius of 3959 miles P, it would then have to descend slash negotiate 128.3 miles of vertical drop over the course of its journey. Commercial planes do not, I say again, do not descend <laughs> 128.3 miles. I can't believe I even have to say this. While traveling at 500 miles an hour for two hours, i.e. they fly level. That's not Q. Therefore, the Earth is not a sphere tard. Therefore, not P. Alice in Wonderland is more tenable than the ball tard spinning space monkey religion. The pro prosecution rests simple. You live in a fairy tale, ball tards. The end.
end of the first leg. Any questions, comments before we get to the second leg of this journey? No, the numbers are nuts, though, aren't they? Yeah. Let's be honest. Yep. Very good. Can't be argued with. Technically, you no need to go any further than this. Like, for anyone who, uh, who's sane and thinks <laughs> with a, you know what I mean, with a logical mind, would know there is no way to argue against that. Nope. Like all this other stuff, it's going to be added in with Adam's presentation, my presentation, then the big bit at the end. That, I mean, technically, none of that should be needed. None of that. I never needed it. The only reason the argument, any of us had to argue past that particular presentation there and what was presented in that, the only reason we, anyone ever has to argue past that is because people out there aren't willing to accept reality. Oh, Adam. Thank you very much. I agree, Brian. Um, and that was the rebuttal. It's the, if you understand that, it's game over. Uh, there was also an objection put to it. Or you can just trim it all off. Um, and this is kind of what my rebuttal point is uh, with regards to that. Um, and if you listen to QE's claim, what's fundamental here is a principle in... Um, avionics which is uh, the, the principle of straight and level flight and that's kind of what i want to just cover briefly and um, brian will do it in more more detail i'm sure but um this is kind of like what intrigued me back in the day so it was back in the beginning where even gravity even affected accelerometers um but what we wanted to do with after Paul on the plane, or even during Paul on the plane's first thing where we switched these things off and saw if they how they registered on the other side of significant transit, um, which again was a non visible. Um, what I kind of envisaged was to um, record that with the knowledge of straight and level flight, record the vectors that the the plane has to take as it traverses the surface. Um, and so that's kind of what I set out to do here, um, which I'll, I'll cover a little bit, not in great detail, but just, just a little bit. But so the, the, the main points I wanna do is just kind of outline some principles in terms of how a plane behaves and why I thought I could therefore plot it in a vector, irrespective of what I was gonna plot it over. Um, so I just want to start with a couple of statements, which I'll go on to then support. So the first is, you know, planes flight, a straight flight is achieved at an angle of two to three degrees. As you can see in the picture, the nose never angles down during flight. Altitude is lost by reducing this angle or reducing speed, um, a decrease in upward thrust. And it's this balance, um, which is the principles of avionics. Basically, a slight tilt backwards is usual in straight and level flight. Um, so how does a plane behave? Um, put simply, the angle the nose is pointing is not the direction of travel. And I've got a little video, um, which I want to share next, QE. So if you can just bear with me a second, I will bring this up. Uh, but I've got to stop skip sharing at I first. Do I have to go back in and share it again? Um, yeah, I'm coming back in now. Hold on. Look, I need to get out. Okay, it should be back there now. Yeah, the lads, this has been well rehearsed. It's, it's the only way to do it through Discord. Um, but the, the, the reason being, I... I Two little one minute clips. So I wanted to give some citation and just to support it, to make it simple, I thought it was easier just to share. So this is from a RAL specialist VFR, which are fundamentals of flight. So they're kind of from flight schools, teaching people how to fly. And like I said, this is just about pitch lift and how the plane's gonna work and what the difference between the direction the nose is pointing in the plane and the direction of travel and how we achieve straight and level flight. So hopefully I'll 
I will press play and you can all hear it if somebody shouts up if they can't. Although both the airspeed and angle of attack control the aircraft's lift, in straight and level flight, the throttle is primarily used to maintain a desired airspeed, and the elevator is used to control the altitude. Keep in mind that the pitch necessary to maintain oh, a flight it. is not always the same, since lift increases the airspeed. Anything. I do the have to join the voice line, to hear this. You have to pitch up to maintain I'm the hearing altitude. it. In normal cruise flight, when an aircraft is maintaining uh, a constant okay. airspeed, Thrust and drag um, are equal. One second. If the pilot increases okay, their stop, output stop, via Adam. the throttle. Okay, stop, stop, Adam. Stop, please, end. Adam. Uh, I don't care if you people are hearing, hearing it in here, okay? I don't care. So just shut up, Adam. Start again. YouTube is hearing it. You guys know what he's going to talk about, so don't worry about it, all right? Rewind back. Start again and finish it. Thank you. to maintain level flight is not always the same. Since lift increases with airspeed, the slower you are flying, the more you have to pitch up to maintain your altitude. In normal cruise flight, when an aircraft is maintaining a constant airspeed, thrust and drag are equal. If the pilot increases their engine output via the throttle, the engine and propeller will spin faster and generate more thrust. This will accelerate the aircraft, as there will then be more thrust than drag. As the aircraft accelerates, more drag will be created, and eventually the amount of drag will equalize with the amount of thrust, and the aircraft will stabilize and maintain its new cruise airspeed. Again, remember that as you increase your airspeed, you will need to lower the aircraft's pitch, or you will start climbing. Good. Okay, so hopefully that was heard. I don't know if chat can confirm that was heard um yeah we heard it you just have to click watch brian i did do that yeah i did okay. do that, but i did it wasn't there originally that's what anyway do we all get the point he's not done you're going slower you've got to pitch up more it's it's fairly straightforward stuff yep okay. hopefully you can see back to the slideshow i've got one more little video to show after this um oh, lovely and that's kind of to, to do with what I've just showed. So what you can see is we're trying to achieve straight and level flight. Now, in little planes like this, you can actually do this visually, and, and often an, an, an experienced pilot will, but certainly not in a 747 or whatever. You're going to use instrumentation, um, and it's the principles of this instrumentation I just want to outline now. So if you were in a little one like this, you could use the horizon, that horizontal line in front of you and you'd either use the top of your dashboard or a certain mark that you know is the correct pitch to be so you want your horizon you want to be pointing just above it okay in a certain way so and that same principle is going to be used in the much larger commercial planes but instead of you just doing it by sight you're going to use a thing called the artificial horizon now this thing is is basically a gyroscope um we all kind of know what that is but this, this thing is going to be the thing that's then going to define how you can attain straight level flight so again if you just bear with me again i've got another quick one minute video to just kind of outline and just use a citation what the gyroscope does um how it works how it's going to give the pilot this confidence because obviously if you can't see the horizon if you're in cloud how do you know you're achieving straight and level flight what are you going to reference and it's, it's this artificial horizon that people will use so again bear with hopefully you can see that and again just a quick minute up screen return to straight and level we are now going to look at the basics of how the artificial horizon works. As a recap, the gyroscope has a property called rigidity. This is the gyroscope's ability to remain at a fixed position in space, whilst the frame around it etc. is moved. The artificial horizon contains a gyroscope, with a rotor that spins level with the horizon. In other words, 
The spin axis is vertical. Once up to speed, the gyroscope will try to remain level with the real horizon. The rotor is connected to two gimbals. The first gimbal, called the roll gimbal, rotates along the longitudinal axis, which turns as the aircraft rolls. The second gimbal, called the pitch gimbal, rotates along the lateral axis, which turns as the aircraft pitches. This allows the rotor to remain level with the horizon as the aircraft pitches and rolls. Okay, so hopefully that's sufficient for the point. We can see that the way that pilot relies on is this knowledge of how a gyroscope works. I don't need to educate anybody on that, but hopefully that's affirmed whether you're a baller or not. So if I can just bring back the slideshow. Okay, so they're, they're the basic principles of what will happen in, in terms of straight and level flight. Um, and as you can see, the angle of attack, the pitch angle with respect to the horizon, isn't the direction that the plane is flying. The plane is, is flying um, per, uh, parallel to, to the surface, to the horizon, um, in a straight line vector. Okay, now... With this knowledge in mind, that's what I said, I set out to do this. I think we all saw D Marble do it with just the standard spirit level. But I just set out to do it with, with you know, the open-mindedness that I may have to adjust and calculate pitch downs as if we're navigating a possible, you know, curved surface, ball surface. So this was, it said on the beginning, 2018, this, I think this, Data was gathered on my summer holidays in 2017. Um, so it's, it's quite a while I've sat here with this data. So obviously, over the flight, I recorded specific periods. You can see here, look, 2.4. There's various fluctuations uh, down to one here, look. Um, but basically, what did I do? I measured for the middle hour of two hour flight, and readings vary between one and four degrees, but never level or down. And that's going to be important in a minute. Um, just assuming in this two hour period, I covered a, a distance of about 800 kilometers, just stats. Um, so then let's let's take it to the point of why we did this. What What's the presupposition we're going to look at? Uh, we know we've a certain, affirmed certain things. We know that plane is flying a straight level vector. Okay, all things being equal, we, we, that is a straight line as defined by the instrumentation and knowledge of gyroscopes. Um, so what could change? Well, if you're on a ball, what the, what the claim is, is that the surface will change, that it won't just fall away, meaning you have to just adapt for altitude because you're always increasing in altitude, but also the orientation of down would change because they would call it the direction of gravity. Now this you know me, I'm going to calculate it. This would be at a rate of 0 0.009 degrees per kilometer of straight line distance. So this is something that you would have to deal with aeronautically, yeah, if you're flying an aeroplane and the surface is falling away and down is curving away at this rate of 0 0.009 degrees. I'll just exemplify it with some fantastic graphics. So if this is my aeroplane and I'm flying at my straight and level flight, all I'm doing is flying in straight and level flight, and that straight level flight is parallel to the surface, to sea level. Nothing to deal with, no mitigation for, maintain straight and level flight, which is the purpose is to maintain altitude. Straight line maintains your altitude. This is fundamentals. If you want to refer to some of these videos I've showed you, it will confirm that. So in all of this time throughout the journey, down is in the same direction. All downs are parallel to each other. 
if I'm now was to take the supposed same journey with all the same parameters equal, except of course I'm traversing a ball, I'm still traveling in my straight line vector. Down at the beginning of the journey is of course down. As I proceed further and further, then the rate of change of down is at 0 0.009 per kilometer, giving me a different down. Now, what would this feel like? A few silly things, and I, I, I won't go into this, but the reality is you're either going to start to feel like you're inclining backwards in your chair, or things have to change because the direction of down is changing, requiring reorientation, which is why I suggested earlier you would have to nose down. This is the point. Even pilots admit this. Wolfie admits this, you know. But the question was, is this ever, does this ever occur in a flight? Like I said, during a one-hour flight, there was no reorientation to down, no realigning to any supposed pointing to the center of a globe, which would require reorientation. Um, so the only conclusion I could make on this flight was the observation and measurement showed no evidence that there was reorientation as all parallel, all downs were parallel with each other and perpendicular to the line of straight travel as confirmed in the instrumentation and the premise of straight and level flight. I'll, I'll finish it there. Um, other than to say it's been a bugbear for quite a while you know i've collected this data we've seen it we all intuitively know this is how airplanes work it's been a real bugbear but um th that my data is worth naught it's it's no more valued than than d marble in his, his spirit level as as true as i know it is um but i'll hand over to brian and he'll probably detail a little bit more now in terms of how straight and level flight is crucial for keeping a plane in the air. Um, over to you, Brian, I'll stop sharing. Well, thanks, Adam. Uh, the first thing I'll say about it, <clears throat> the first thing I'll say is that what your data shows is that D Marble, what Dean Marble did with his spirit level, it was, like, I think that was ingenious because it's so simple and it can't be argued with. He showed by recording a little spirit, one foot long spirit level or whatever size the spirit level was, he showed that the plane is not at any point pitching down. It has a constant, slightly above horizontal pitch. Because the spirit level, when it is absolutely level, shows a horizontal. And the spirit level above it was always slightly to the back of the plane, very slightly, which showed that he was, the plane was always with a slight, a constant horizontal, a constant, slight constant above horizontal pitch. Now, what your data shows is, your data shows something different. Your data shows the same thing, but it's showing that the, the way you went about it, getting that data shows that the direction of down, that vector, has to change as you go around a convex surface. It has to, because from mile to mile accumulated, that vector has to change. There's no way around it. And that would mean that mechanical gyroscopes would have to completely reorientate themselves and horizontal would have to be a different horizontal than the previous horizontal. So how can horizontal be at a different pitch to horizontal? You know, it, it's, it's crazy. So <laughs> that's what, do you know what I mean? It, it can't be done, right? It's total and utter nonsense. <clears throat> now, at the start of this presentation, uh, QE showed, right, with his portion, what they don't account for. Things that aren't accounted for, they would have to be accounted for. There's no way around it. There's no if, buts, no maybes. They're not, these things are not accounted for, and they would have to be accounted for if you're flying over a convex surface uh, with a radius of close to 25,000 miles, right? Whereas Adam's portion was shown data, which, right, which proves that they're not reorientation. They're not reorientating um, uh, for a convex surface. The, the, the direction of down, those vectors aren't reorientated, right? So now I'm going to show, although Adam covered a little bit of what, a little bit of what I'm going to cover. Now I'm going to show, like, not just what they're not doing, right, or what the data shows that they're not doing, but the reason they're not doing it. And there's a very good reason. Now, we all know, right, if you understand this, the reason they're not doing it is because the earth is flat. 
But there's actually a second reason that is actually there's actually a second reason that is um, <clears throat> that is kind of overlooked. Now, when I brought this up, right, to Wolfie and others, right, a couple of years ago, uh, they started not wanting people who were claiming to be commercial pilots and blah blah blah. There were six or seven of them I was dealing with online. None of them wanted to address it because they knew that what I was talking about could not be argued with. And that is the lift effect. You can't argue with this, and I'm going to show you why. So <clears throat> here we have an airplane on screen, right? Straight above that airplane is lift, straight below is weight, right? To the back of it is drag, and to the front of it is, is thrust, right? So very simple, there are the four basic, what they call forces of flight, even though lift is not a force, it's just an effect, right? But we'll call it a force of flight for, the, for ease of explanation. So on, could you go on to my next uh, uh, um, slide, please, QE? Okay, <clears throat> so you can zoom in if you want, right? So this is some basics from NASA, right, uh, right, right about balance and unbalanced forces. So for this, lift, when lift overcomes weight, plane rises. When weight overcome, overcomes lift, plane falls. When drag overcomes thrust, overcomes the thrust, plane slows. When the thrust overcomes the drag, the plane accelerates, right? Very simple stuff. Right. These are just that's what these are just facts of flight. No way around. Uh, next slide, please, QE, which be slide number three, I think. <clears throat> OK, forces in a client. Now, never mind all the uh, never mind all the uh, 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 maths and stuff. That's not part of it. The reason I'm showing this is that where it says if you want to zoom in, if you want, where it says horizontal axis, as long as people can see it, is to the left there. Just right. The point I'm making is that that horizontal axis, right, that is zero degrees on the attitude indicator, also known as the artificial horizon, right? Even within that video that Adam showed, uh, the guy said that the artificial horizon is level with the horizon. No, it's parallel with the horizon. It can't be level with the horizon because the horizon would be sea level or be the earth and it's below it. So it's not, so that was actually, by that guy saying that, was incorrect. It's parallel with the horizon. So the whole point of it is, of the attitude indicator and with the gyroscope, is it creates a horizontal. And all pitch, right, all pitch is above and below that horizontal line. And on the attitude indicator, that's zero, right? Now, before anyone wants to attack me and talk about angle of attack and how angle of attack and pitch is not exactly the same, no, angle of attack is about the core line of the wings, right? Pitch is about how much the nose of the airplane is pitched above horizontal. But the angle of attack and pitch are all right, calculated from that zero degrees horizontal. So the pitch and the angle of attack, right, if you want to fly from point A to point B, right, travel any distance at all and hold a constant altitude, then you must fly with a slightly above horizontal pitch and your angle of attack will be above horizontal. Right. The point being is that that's the only way to get from point A to point B. That is it. That's the only way. So, and that means that at no point is the pilot breaking horizontal. At no point is the pilot ever breaking horizontal, which means that horizontal is a constant for flight from position A to position B, whether it be 100 miles of a distance or 1,000 miles of a distance it's still the same. If they want to get from position A to position B, the only times that they're ever going to, do, they're ever going to make any changes to that pitch and, and any time be below horizontal will be briefly, or if they have to because of weather and stuff, drop in altitude. Okay? Uh, next uh, slide, please, QB. Uh, you can zoom in a little bit on this. This is, again, another uh, talk about rate of climb. And that, but the reason I have this is because it shows they are horizontal plane, right, on the right-hand side there. And so that's zero degrees again. That is zero on the attitude indicator. That is uh, your horizontal that's parallel to mean sea level, right? That's what it is. And the, the reason I don't have better, um, uh, better diagrams, official diagrams, that show the word horizontal on it is because it could be just be me with Google with me, right? But I could not find them. 
right? I had these were that one and the, this one here and uh, the one before it, I think the next one as well, I, I already had, right? And I, I in, the, in the past, I used to be able to find a lot more references to do with flight with the word horizontal in it. It seems that I, maybe as Google, I cowed not and I scoured for an hour and a half find references on diagrams with the word horizontal in it. They'll try and change out horizontal for what's known as relative wind, even though relative wind is not always, it's not always, if you understand flight, it's not always going to be referred to be horizontal. But if you're flying from point A to point B, then they will view relative wind as horizontal. But they're changing out the word horizontal for and putting in relative wind. Uh, and there's different terms that they're adding in and they're using level and different things, but they're not using horizontal, which is the word I wanted. Because there is no argument about what horizontal is, right? But it doesn't matter. The point being is that uh, on this slide, the previous slide, and if you go on to the next one, please, Kiwi. And on this slide, once again, horizontal reference. So it's showing, right, that zero degrees is horizontal. There is no zero degrees of something else. It is the horizontal reference. And at no point does the pilot break that horizontal, right? And this is the reason why. Next slide, please, Kiwi. Okay, Adam uh, already covered a little bit of this already, so I'm going to, just going to recover it because it's, it's, it's connected, this portion, because it's connected to the lift effect, right? <clears throat> when a pilot wants to fly faster than cruising speed, they have to have, because thrust generates lift. Now, here's a funny story. When I first stated that thrust generated lifts a couple, couple of years ago, I had people like Wolfie disagree with me. And in my next video, some days later, because right, I knew he was being completely dishonest, I produced a citation from Boeing which stated that trust creates lift. Right? And the reason, right? <laughs> like, why would any commercial pilot argue against that? It makes no sense. Right? Why would you argue against that? Right? The reason why is because the chord line of the wings is right, the angle of attack will be always above horizontal when they're flying from point A to point B. I'm not talking about if they're in a cruise or if they're in a climb or in a descent. I'm talking about when they're flying, flying from point A to point B. It'll always be above horizontal. The pitch will always be above horizontal, which, as I said, is zero on the attitude indicator. So if they want to hold an altitude and they want to fly faster than cruising speed, then what they must do is pitch down a little bit but they won't pitch below horizontal. So they'll pitch to about two degrees above horizontal, maybe 1.5, two degrees, if they want to fly at the, the plane's top speed, right? Because they'll then hold the altitude they're at, right, uh, and be able to increase their speed. Whereas if they increased their speed but didn't do that, what would happen is they'd raise an altitude, right? So to hold the same altitude, which I'll go in, get into in a minute why it's important, um, and to increase your speed, then they have to pitch down slightly, but they never pitch to horizontal or below. It's always still 1.5 to 2 degrees above horizontal. Right? They're still pitched above horizontal. If they want to fly at cruising speed, they'll have probably 3 to 5 degree uh, pitch above horizontal. If, and that way they'll hold that same uh, altitude while flying uh, um, uh, from A to B at that at, at, at cruising speed, right? So they won't be pitched high and they won't be pitched low towards horizontal. They'll be pitched somewhere in between. If they want to fly slower, right, which is the bottom, the third, um, the bottom diagram, if they want to fly slower, <clears throat> what they'll do is, and hold the same altitude, they've got to pitch high. So they've got to go up to about six, seven degrees of pitch, right? So fly slower but hold the same altitude, right? So this is just a given of flight. Now, why do they want to hold the same altitude? Now, for a small plane that is on the diagram here, it may not matter a whole lot, right? Because they might just be flying out of a local airport and flying about and not doing that in particular. But they still have to adhere to, it, uh, adhere to a certain altitude or stay within a certain altitude, once, like, especially if it's anywhere near a bigger airport, right? But the thing about it is, if you take away these small little Cessna type planes that are on this, uh, on this uh, diagram, and you replace them with something like uh, uh, an Airbus A380, right? One of the big commercial planes. I need the commercial planes, right? What they do is they fly in, in 
super sky highways, basically, right? And the problem with that is that if they want to change altitude, they've got to request from ground control, they've got to request permission to do that. So if they want to, uh, let's just say, raise or lower an altitude, they've got to contact the local ground control and say, this is flight blah, 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 going from point to wherever city to whatever city, and we're requesting, can we go down to, uh, let's say, 30,000 feet from 35,000 feet, or can we go up to 38,000 feet from 35,000 feet because of whatever X, Y, Z reason, right? Right. They can't just right, have a high pitch and increase speed and not care. Because what happens is they end up going, if they keep a high pitch right above horizontal and increase their speed, the plane will raise, because of the extra thrust, will raise an altitude, right? And if it raises an altitude, it's like you taking your car and driving it over into the wrong side of the road. You're going to be in someone else's lane, right? So you can't do that. The same thing is if you want to fly slower but not increase your pitch, right? Uh, then what's going to happen is you're going to go down in altitude. And when you go down in altitude, once again, it's like if you imagine it, you're in a three-lane, right? Uh, you're, you're in a three-lane highway, right? Where there's three lanes on either side or whatever, and you are in the middle lane, and you're trying to go into the lane on the left or the lane on the right, but you're not slowing down to go into the lane on the right, and you're not speeding up to go into the lane on the left. You're just pulling in there willy-nilly, any old way, right? You're going to get in people's way. And when it comes to traveling in the air, it could be a case of you. you may, it's not just a case of the plane that's flying from behind you is flying faster. Right, or you're flying faster, you're going to fly into the lack of it. It could be flying directly towards you. So they can't do that. They've got to hold an altitude, which means that to hold an altitude and change their, their, their thrust and their speed, their airspeed, they've got to change the pitch. Right? But it's always pitch above horizontal. Why is it always pitch above horizontal? Why? Because that is how lift works. To account for 100% of the weight of the plane, right, you've got to create, generate, as a pilot, 100% positive lift. Right? If you're not generating 100% positive lift, what will happen is, is you're going to be slow, either, it depends on how much lift you're losing, you're going to fall out of the sky. Now, to generate 100% positive lift, to oppose 100% of the weight of the plane, You've got to have an above horizontal pitch. That means at no point from, let's say, Vancouver to Miami, at no point during that flight, can that pilot decide to pitch below horizontal and expect to, to, to hold adequate lift. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. It's just, it's just the nature of the game. It's just the way the lift effect works. That even if the Earth was a globe, the lift effect would still work the way it works, right? Uh, uh, basically, basically, planes couldn't exist if the Earth was a globe. Planes, air, air travel and planes can only exist because the Earth is a flat plane. That allows people to go from A to B in straight lines because that's the only way a plane can fly. It cannot fly around a curved surface because that would mean losing lift. So if you go on to the next uh, uh, slide, please, QE, Right, so this is you've seen it earlier. We've all seen this. This is the attitude indicator. Whereas two orange lines are across that black line with that orange dot in the middle, that's zero degrees. That's the horizontal that's been created right by the gyroscope. Right. If you go on to the next uh, slide, please, Kiwi. The purple line I have placed in here, right, this purple line would represent kind of an average above horizontal pitch throughout a flight. So. Anything below where those, or two, those two orange, orange lines are would be a below horizontal pitch, right? Now, those orange lines would be up where that pink line is or purple line is, because you know, that's, that's what would raise and lower. And the black line would be the zero degrees. But anything below, let's just say those two orange lines, if that purple line went below them, that would be a below horizontal pitch. During flight, the, the pilot will always have an average of of this much pitch above those, that black line, where that purple line is. It might be slightly, if they want to go faster, it'll be slightly closer to the black line. 
to undergo slower, it'll be slightly further from the black line. But the point is, it will always be, always, from Vancouver to Miami, or from your house to your friend's house 100 miles away, it's always going to be above horizontal. It will always be above that black line. So they can't pitch below it, right, without losing lift. Right? So if you go on to the next one, QE, uh, and I'm sorry that this is not a more clear, I tried to clean it up as best I could. I'm sorry it's not a more clear diagram, it's an old diagram, but it shows, it's the one diagram I got that showed exactly what would needed to be shown. <clears throat> this blue line along the center of the, or uh, let's say along the middle, it's slightly below the middle, but the blue line uh, along the middle, that is your zero degree, right? You have a line coming up Right, this cut we call another line moving through the wing here called the chord line. Another blue line at the wing above it called the chord line. And the same on the diagram at the bottom, you have another blue line, unbroken line, and that's called the chord line again. Right? So you have t the same wing, one, uh, in one part of the diagram it's pitched above horizontal, in the other part of, of the diagram it's pitched below. Right? Now, you have another line, a, a broken line on the above part of the diagram, a broken serrated line with zero lift line wrote on it, right? And you have the same on the bottom, you have the same serrated line, but it's not at an angle, with zero lift line wrote, written on it there as well. That zero lift line, right, above, on the part above, that is when the plane or the pilot pitches too far above horizontal, what happens is they'll reach a point where the plane will stop generating lift. They'll reach a point called, called stall. And when they reach that point, I won't go into the details of a stall, but it basically means they can't operate the plane correctly. And the plane is, can then just start falling out of the sky because they're not generating lift because they are too much above horizontal pitch. They're not generating lift and it's dangerous, right? So basically, when, it go, when the plane goes into a stall, what it means is it's too vertical, basically too close to vertical, let's just say. Now, it won't be actually vertical, but it'll be too close to vertical. And it won't be, the, the plane won't be, the wings won't be generating lift. The thrust, it basically, it's, it's a very dangerous situation to do their best not, not to encounter it, right? Below, on the bottom diagram, you have that serrated line that says zero, that says zero lift line again. Now, what that serrated line is actually showing is it's, that is actually the blue line in the center, right? And you have a core line of the wings there at an angle below that. So that serrated line is the zero degree line that's in the center. That is it. Because that is showing when the core line of the wings is, is the angle of attack is below that horizontal line, right? You have zero lift, right? What that means is not that you don't have any lift, just so in case any ballers want to attack. It's not that I understand it. It's not that it doesn't mean there is no lift. What it means is you're not generating lift, right? So if you have an, a, blue, a below horizontal pitch with the, core, uh, with the core line, right, the angle of attack is below horizontal, that means that even with a, what's known as a cambered wing, right, which will hold more lift than other wings, right, over with a below horizontal pitch, but even at that, they'll only hold a certain amount and it'll only, it'll only hold a certain amount, and it will only hold it dependent, like once you get to about four degrees below horizontal, it's holding basically nothing. Nine degrees, or five degrees, may, or sorry, 5% positive lift or something. Now, a cambered wing, if you go to two degrees below horizontal, might hold 60 or 70% positive lift. Right? But that doesn't mean anything, because it's not generating 100% positive lift. Now other wings, once, they, once the core line goes below horizontal, that's it. They're not generating lift at all. But with the cambered wing, it is still holding on to or generating a certain amount of lift, but it's only generating maybe 60-70% at a 2 degree below horizontal pitch. When it gets to 3 degrees, it would be lucky to be 40-50%. to 50 And 2 degrees, you're talking maybe 10%. Right? Or sorry, 4 degrees, you'd be talking there maybe 10% positive lift. But who cares? Because the point being is that the wing is not generating 100% positive lift, so it's not accounting for 100% of the weight of the plane. Which means that any pitch, right, whether it be pitch of the nose, because it'll be the same thing if the nose is pitching down, right, for most planes except for the B50, right, bomber, for basically all other planes, 
right? When the nose is pitching down, then the angle attack of the wings will also be pitching down, right? Or be heading for a pitch down, which means that it won't be generating lift, which means it's falling out of the sky. So that means to fly around the globe, you have to pitch below horizontal. There is no way around it, which means that if you do that, you're falling out of the sky because you're not generating lift. So it doesn't matter even if you have a cambered wing, you're still falling out of the sky just slightly slower. So your so your descending angle towards crashing into the ground will just be will just be longer. That's hypotenuse of that. Well, you can't really have a hypotenuse, but you know what I mean. That like, that's the only way I can describe it because that's how it's actually described. It's you're going to be you're careering into the ground. There's no way around it. So the only way for that plane and that pilot and all the passengers and all the crew to get from Vancouver to Miami is by holding a hol- a, an above horizontal pitch at all times, right, to generate enough lift for them to get there. That means they never break horizontal, which means they can't fly around the globe. It's not that they're not just not doing it because the earth is flat. They can't because lift makes it impossible. So if you just go to the last slide, QE, before we have a reprieve, please. Thank you. <clears throat> and you can zoom in up towards the top there, if you don't mind, for the audience, because uh, so they'll see it up where I have some things written and stuff, <clears throat> if you can do that. So here we have a globe out, right? And we have a red serrated line around the outside of it, uh, depicting, uh, depicting um, <clears throat> an altitude above it. So if you want to hold a constant altitude above that globe out, you've got to follow this red serrated line. Can you zoom, zoom, in, on, zoom in on that a little bit, QE, for the audience? That's as best as it's getting. Okay, no hassle. It's okay. They'll be able to see it anyway, right? Yep. So for this plane, it starts at this black dot here up, up above where it says altitude above a globe, right? For that plane and that pilot to travel around the globe, let's just say this blue line, the length of this blue line as an arc is about, let's say, one Let's say one quarter, right, or one fifth of the of the full arc uh, of the, the full circumference of the globe. For that plane to do that, then bit by bit by bit, right, that pilot from the from the minute that they get to cruising altitude, they can only be horizontal technically from a mathematical point of view for one second. After that, they've got they're going to ha- have to have an accumulated below horizontal pitch. To follow this red line around the outside of the globe, that's what it has to be. Because you remember that red line is would be would be mean sea level on the globe, right? A parallel or would be a, a emulating mean sea level six miles above, five six miles above, whatever, right? So the only way for them to do that is to have a, an accumulation of below horizontal pitch. And as you can see by the blue line, right, as the further they travel in a straight line the greater the amount of below horizontal pitch they would have to have, right? But they can't pitch below horizontal because they won't have any lift. So they must follow this straight blue line. There is no way around it. Now, how can they follow this straight blue line, hold a constant altitude at the same time, right? Not crash into anything and get from A to B safely 10,000 times a day if the earth is a globe. Because if the earth was a globe, they'd have to follow this red line and have no lift and eventually crash into it. There's just be no way around it. It's not po- like it's literally impossible. The lift effect, effect makes it impossible for a plane to fly around a convex surface, a consistently convexing surface. It's impossible. They can't do it because they have to break this blue line, this blue horizontal line to follow this red serrated line. And they can't do that because they won't have lift. If you don't have lift, it's like not having wheels on your car. You're not driving anywhere. You're not going anywhere. And that's why people like Wolfie and all these other commercial pilots, or plane commercial pilots, uh, who were he was dealing with, all disappeared when I brought the lift effect to him. And I didn't bring it up straight away. I knew about it, but I was more uh, talking about pitch with them and different things like that. And they were bad when it came to that. But when I brought up lift, none of them wanted to deal with it because they all know you can't argue with lift. It can't be argued with. A plane cannot fly around the globe because it needs to generate because the pilot needs to generate enough lift to account for the full weight of the plane, and the pilot can't do that unless they have a pitch above this blue horizontal line. End of presentation for this part. Any questions? Chat. Um, 
Just one. Super mustache, super fluid. I waited till after you were done Thank with you. this portion. Okay, baby. Uh, Mike eight oh eight sent nothing, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Nathan. There's just be a, a momentary. Um, it's only a very pause. minor point. It's a ter tertiary system to what Brian's describing in any event. But did did you ever look at trim? I yeah, I know about trim, but it's all based. See, uh, trim. I, I could go into trim, and I understand it. But the whole point of trim is all connected to having to keep generating lift. Yes. So just, gonna, just, just, sorry, just, just mention just briefly. I'll keep it as well. Use your pitch angle. So you uh, uh, Adam, trim. belly up to that mic. I am right next to it. So I, I don't know why, but yeah. So, yeah, trim is part of maintaining straight and level flight. Because obviously you've got... All sorts. You've got different air speeds hitting you, which generates different thrust. So there might be a point where you've got a gust and that takes you up a bit. So you'll just tweak your trim a little bit to bring you back down to, as Brian says, the correct lane. And then you'll just tweak it back again to maintain your straight and level flight. Can, can I just explain what trim is to the audience? If, if you're a pilot and you've got to maintain the slight pitch up, if you were to do that with the yoke, that is to say your hands are on it and you're holding it, You'd knack yourself out pretty damn quickly if you're having to fight the aerodynamic forces of the plane in flight because it's not like a car rolling along a road where the tyres in contact with the road keep it at that level. It's not going to sink into the pavement and it's not going to fly off the road unless it's a wash in the 90s. You know what I'm getting at? It's going to it's going to maintain that with the road. Well, a plane can't do that, so you've got to obviously put in adjustments to the, the flight to make it do that. Well, so that they don't have to constantly pull back slightly to maintain pitch up, they trim the, the aircraft, which is to say they make it so that it's constantly in a configuration where it's going to maintain that without them having to pull. Yeah, that's it. We ready to continue? Yeah, I just, could I just say something? Yes, before go. We, yep. Before we go, about this next section. This has been years in the making, right? Took a lot of time to get to this point. Not our fault. We were stalling from people, other people, right? Um, and a little bit of ignorance on, on, on my part, I will say. Um, but it was due to misinformation, let's just say, uh, that I was given. This point has been coming a long time. This is the accumulation of everything that we have done concerning this argument for the past decade for some people, nine years for me. And this is the be-all and end-all. This, what we're going to show next, ends all debate. There is no if buts, there's no maybes, there's no argument against. Anyone who's making an argument against or in any way speaking negative about this next section, you can be sure they're either one of two things. They're either a complete ignoramus and don't have a clue about what they're talking about, or they're intentionally deceiving you, and they don't care what side they're on, flat or globe. Right, it's either one or the other. That was the point of the three parts, okay, and particularly the detailed explanation of how aeroplanes work via people that fly and teach you how to fly aeroplanes. Yeah, great detail from you. And part of the problem we've had, isn't it, in the past is, like I said, all I had was me and my accelerometer data, which is, you know, not flight data. For a long time, we've been begging for some pitch data so we could analyze a flight. And that kind of brings us to today. Um, Kiwi, you've got on screen the initial opening bit. Do you, are you going to read the opening? Yes, I am. Oh, yep. yes, so I am. Sorry. Yes, I Off am, you sir. Go, sir. Ladies oh. and gentlemen. This is the obituary for Globe Tardia, brought to you by the National Transportation Safety Board. This is from December 3rd, 2018, from the Flight Data Recorder, Specialist Factual Report by Greg Smith. Just to give a little background, a little context, location, Honolulu, Hawaii, date, February 13th, 2018, aircraft, Boeing 777. Operator United Airlines. The text reads, 
on February 13th, 2018, about 1,200 hours Hawaiian Standard Time, HST, a Boeing 777-222 airplane operated by United Airlines as Flight 1175 experienced an in-flight separation of a fan blade as well as the inlet duct and fan cowls of number two right engine, a Pratt & Whitney. During cruise flight en route to Daniel K. Inouye International Airport, Honolulu, Hawaii. While the airplane was in level cruise flight at flight level 360, that's 36,000 feet, the flight crew heard a loud bang that was followed by a violent shaking of the airplane that was followed by warnings of a compressor stall. The flight crew shut down the engine, declared it an emergency, and proceeded to HNL, Honolulu National International Airport, for a single-engine landing without further incident, landing at about 12.37 HST. The 364 passengers, two pilots, and eight flight attendants on board deplaned normally at the gate, and there were no injuries. The airplane was operating as regularly scheduled flight in accordance with the provisions of 14 Code of Federal Regulations CFR Part 121 from the San Francisco International Airport, SFO, San Francisco, California, to HNL. That is the background. That is the context. One more small thing that Brian will be going over that's encased in this document and is the death knell for a globe tardia. He will be showing this. And ironically, dovetails with my B example on the globe ter terminator.com. On the X axis, um, stop, stop. On the X axis, right here, it has 0, 0800 hours. I will move to 10 out. 1,100 hours. That is two-hour flight at an average of 500 miles an hour, sunshines. I just wanted to point this out because Adam, I'm sorry, Brian will be going into this in his presentation momentarily. This is encased inside this document. There is no doubt. Just, just to add to that, that same section of data loves tails with my data as well, particularly with respect to the pitch angle data. It's virtually identical. Interesting. Yeah. See this, folks. We're going to be focusing on this little thing right here. This flat line for two hours at 500 miles an hour called pitch. Focus your attention there. Brian will be going over this. I'm just trying to point this out to you. And altitude pressure right here. The altitude, which is also flatlined for two hours at 500 miles an hour, ladies and gentlemen. Just, you want to add before anything? Brian does, yeah, Do want, before do, Brian goes into it, just to reiterate the point, as he read the captain's report kind of stuff at the beginning nobody was hurting this as you can probably see from the data itself uh, I have a whole there's, thing. there's 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 an engine explosion in the middle of the flight which is where you can see it's disrupted and then a, a very disruptive landing um but what qe's referenced is that bit that, that's saying you know in in straight and level flight and it's that straight and level flight before the engine erupts that two hour period at 500 miles an hour that that QE referenced and the pitch angle over a two hour period that I referenced that we're gonna look at. And, and that's sufficient amount of data. We don't need the whole flight of the implications as we've outlined in points one, two, and three, what straight and level flight would imply with regards to gaining of altitude and reorientation and keeping the plane in the sky um hopefully that's clear so maybe we can go to brian and look at this in a yep. bit more detail because it's been a long time coming on it 
Yes, it has. Brian, the yeah. presentation is up with their next slide on screen. Okay, I've got to say something. <clears throat> um, I looked for this data years ago, and I'm not the only person to ask for it. I know Flatside was asking for it from the same people, but one particular person who we'll get into later on. But we've asked for it for years, and we were given the impression that it costs thousands to get, and it's really sensitive data, and blah, 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 and we can't get it. And would you believe that a bowler got me this? A bowler contacted me uh, through WhatsApp and email, and he actually, he works for uh, Airbus, I think it is, or I think it's Airbus, or one of those aerospace, I think one of the biggest aerospace companies, anyway, he works for one of the biggest aerospace companies in the UK, uh, or, or work of, out of the UK, I should say. I think it's Airbus. Um, he actually got it for me. Now, his YouTube name, right, and he wants me to use his YouTube name, is Buck Sodbuster. Now, when I found out he was a baller, I didn't realize he was a baller for it. Not that he was hiding it, but I just, because he was being so cordial with me I, and talking with me, I just thought that he was a flat earther. I just kind of presumed he was. Because uh, he was even speaking to me about certain things, and the way he was speaking to me wasn't dishonest. It was just, uh, the way he was speaking was just like kind of person to person, no hiding of anything. And I checked, uh, sorry, not just me, me and QE and Nathan and Adam checked out we made sure that we could find this document and other documents connected to it on the NTSB website. And yes, they are there. This is not some, uh, we've checked uh, um, and verified, this is not some made up document by the ballers or anything else. This is real. And we can give a link, an actual link, to where you can see this document, to where you can download the document, the PDF, and it's all from the NTSB website. Now, he was good with me because I told him, look, I said, he sent me a couple of flights and they were kind of short in duration. And I said, look, I said, even though those short flights are a bit short, I said, but also I can't use any flight if there's been people injured and especially if there's someone was killed. Um, it has to be. And so he went off and went and found uh, three or four flights uh, that were longer in duration and uh, where nobody was killed or injured. It was just like a hard landing or like with this flight uh, here in particular where they need to do an emergency landing in Honolulu was because one of the engines failed. But other than that, the flight happened exactly as flight happens, right? So that's the only difference. And even with one engine failed, that didn't change how the plane was flying. Still fl flew the same, right? So this is years in the making, this. And this is the data, the actual data from a commercial flight, and this is verified from the NTSB website that anyone can download and anyone can see, and not just this, they can see any amount of it. So it doesn't cost thousands and thousands and thousands to get this data, and it isn't very sensitive material. It's literally there for anyone to download. And what the guy said to me, uh, this guy Steve, whose YouTube name is Box Oddbuster, what he said to me is, I don't know why you never... Well, you, if he said I, I could find it in 10 minutes. Now, he, he's within an arena where he would be pointed in the right direction or he'd know where to go. It, but it never crossed my mind to check out the NTSB website because I was under the impression, because I've been told by commercial pilots on the globe side, one in particular, or one or two in particular, that you can't just get this data and it's very sensitive and it costs thousands. So I didn't think... Right, because I couldn't find it myself. I didn't think for a moment, not for a moment, that it would just be there for free. They, you can just literally download it. You just have to look for it in the right place. I didn't think you could do that. And that's why I didn't have it sooner. That's why we didn't have it sooner. It's not all about me. I'm just saying that's why we didn't have it sooner. All of us. Not just us, but everyone, in, uh, everyone within this arena. So here we go. This is the pitch data. This is the actual data from a flight that started at 7.15 in the morning and finished at 5 past 1 in the day, okay? Okay, on the, on the screen in front of you, you can see a chart with different uh, lines and different things across it. The orange line, I don't know if QE can zoom in on that, but the orange line is pitch, right? Over to the right-hand side of the orange line, you'll see degrees. You have zero degrees, and you have it going up to 20 degrees and down to 10 degrees, right? The only times 
that the pitch is below zero degrees is when the plane is on the tarmac. <laughs> because you can follow, that's the only times you can follow the pitch and you can follow the altitude, right? The altitude is down below, it's a black line at the very bottom, and you can follow the pitch, and I'm going to show you more clearly in a minute, and how the altitude and pitch work in tandem with each other. And as you can see, following the pitch and the, and the altitude, there's at no point, does the pitch, is there any pitching down and going, going on without there being a change in altitude? Or pitching up without them being, as in, there won't be any pitch down without the altitude of the plane changing, which means that they, they had to change altitude, and so they, had, right, so they had to pitch down for that moment, but after that, they pitch back up, and it's back to holding an above horizontal pitch. Um, next slide, please, Kiwi, if you don't mind. So this slide here, right, I've tried to uh, take the pitch and amalgamate it up with the altitude. Now, I had to leave out the uh, heights in feet, um, like 30,000, 40,000 feet, for the altitude and the pitch degrees on the right because the altitude had it on the left and the pitch had it on the right. And to match them all together, I had to move both of them, one left and one right, so I had to leave out those parts. But it doesn't matter because, as you can see here, the orange line being the pitch, and I put in a blue line here at zero degrees. As you can see very clearly, at no point does that orange line ever dip below the, the blue line. Only at two points does it appear to kind of slightly do it. And at both those points, and what the first point is more pronounced, there's a change in altitude, which means that you can see from the black line of the altitude here, the plane literally descended, which means at the pressure angle downward, right? Then leveled out again, then descended slightly again, right? Then leveled out again. And every time they leveled out, the pitch was back up below, above the blue line, which is above zero degrees, which is above horizontal, because it has to be because of lift, right? And as you can see, then they have an increase, an increase in altitude, right? And you can see it's matching the pitch, and then they level out again, and then they land. And that, when you see that squiggly line at the end, that's what landing always looks like, because there's a lot of pitching and moving around and up and down going on for the landing, right? So that's basically, from what I could see, what landing always looks like on, on, on the pitch data, right? But it is totally obvious, without a shadow of a doubt, that at no point is there anything that's, any point that there isn't a consistent above horizontal here. And this is from once the plane got into the air, you're talking close to 8 o'clock in the morning, right through to, uh, you're talking half 12 in the day, right? So that's oh, many hours right. of it being above one second. What is it, Adam? Oh. I'm off. I'm in the middle of it. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, okay, carry on. Just let me carry on. If you have, just let me go through it, right? Well, maybe Adam hasn't seen my slides. <clears throat> okay. So just go on to the next slide, QE, please. Okay. This is the same as the last slide I just added in sepia for the audience. They might be able to see it a bit clearer. And some people, if with the colors, they might have an issue, like Nathan is colorblind. So this might help them see it better. Where the black line, where you see pitch, and the black line underneath where it says the word pitch, that is, right, zero degrees. And the pitch is above that at all times, right? So there was no way around it. This is the actual data, right? The black line is the consistent horizontal that could never be broken. That could never be broken and was never broken during this flight and isn't broken during any flight. If you're talking about any flight that's going from a distance from A to B. I'm not talking about acrobatics in, in a jet fighter. I'm talking about going from A to B. At no point is that black line broken. They must always pitch above that black line, which means they're never pitching below that black line, which means they're never breaking that black line, which means they're traveling along that black line, essentially. Okay? So this, the only reason I added in sepia was only for people with the colors. Sometimes the colors can confuse people, and it's not as easy to see. But you can see here when it's in sepia, it's very clear. So, next one, please, Kiwi. Okay, this is the section we're going to focus on, right? This is from 5 past 8 in the morning to 5 past 10 in the morning. So, this is two hours where there was no need to change in altitude. As you can see, the altitude pressure, right, remains equal, which will, I think it was around 35,000 feet, and the pitch remains equal above horizontal there's no need to change an altitude there was no pitching down or pitching up it was consistent 
for two hours non-stop. Now that means that it, the, the plane flew right at 500 miles because we worked it out with the airspeed. It flew at 5,000 miles an hour, right, that's statue of miles, right, for two hours, that's 1,000 miles. So there was 1,000 miles of flight happened where at no point did they, did they have to change an attitude, so they, at no point did they have to change their pitch. So they held probably a constant, I think it was around a plus three degrees uh, above horizontal pitch constantly for two hours in this particular flight. Now, they are obviously held plus degree, three degrees many times during the flight, as I just showed. But the point being is that, is that for this two-hour period, this two-hour window, there was no need to change uh, altitude. They also had four engines working. Everything was fine, right? So if you just come down to my next slide, please, Kiwi. Uh, one no. second, one second. I think it, there yeah. we go. No, it's the one after that. That was the one that you should have had on screen a minute ago. This one? Yeah, did you have that one on screen a second ago when I was talking? No. The two-hour window? No, oh, we're good. Up to that a second. We're, we're good, though. All right, so there's that, that two-hour window. Okay, this here, this next slide, I've drawn up on GeoGebra, right? So this is from point A to point B, right? So they had, for that two-hour window, right, uh, there was 1,000 miles traveled. Now, if they could never break this blue serrated line at any point, right, that means the plane flew this track. It flew this straight blue serrated line from point A to point B, which means that technically, right, if you're talking about trying to add in a globe, it was 132 miles, of, right, if you were talking about a globe, that would be a straight line which would place the plane at 132 miles, right, above that 1,000 mile point on the globe, right, <laughs> our plane, right? And if you take away the six miles, the six miles of altitude, it's 126 miles. So technically, according to the pitch data and the actual data of the actual flight, the plane was 126 miles out of whack with the globe. <laughs> That's what it shows. But it, more importantly, it shows that there is no globe because there can't be. Because planes can't fly the way they must fly and the Earth be a globe, it's just impossible. Not only does what QE showed, not only does it validate what QE showed and has been shown for years, and validate what Adam has showed and has showed for years, and Adam's data, right, and validate what I've been saying about the lift effect, right, for years, but it, it shows without a shadow of a doubt, even if all three of us got everything wrong, this shows what's actually happening. And it, it is absolutely in line and in tandem with exactly what we've been saying and other people are on our side of this argument have been saying for years. There was no if, buts, or maybes about it. The earth is flat. There was no argument against this. It can't be argued against. This is official pitch data from, an, from United Airlines, from the NTSB. It's just, you can't get any more official. The only thing more official than that you can get is if the President of the United States actually put his stamp on it. That's the only way to make it more official. If, if I may, if I may. Yes, uh, I'll finish you. If yep. I may. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Turn out the lights! The globe tarts flatlined! That's we, all I had. Have we not got a better sound bite? That? Have we not got a bit? <laughs> yes, we, yes, we do. Just give it can time. Let them finish it? up the... Let them finish up the presentation. Yeah. So to finish up this presentation, I have an extra part to go on at the end. I have an extra part. If Adam wants to say anything because he wanted to say something earlier, oh. we can take a quick reprieve here and then move on to the next part and then we'll have to finish. This is this is the Bribwinian paradox in a way, because <laughs> at this point, you've just I'm not sure what what drop you would have to accumulate here for straight and level flight with regards to point one but over this thousand miles you're gonna accumulate a 14 degree difference <laughs> yeah, in terms of where it down supposedly is in your straight level flight so just in this two seconds that was the point of me interrupting just to point out how the stars have aligned how pertinent it is both in my presentation and qe's we cite this two hour period yeah 
and that's what we've got in this data so that was that was only my excitement if you see what i mean but yep. yeah 14 degrees or how much accumulated um altitude is it qe i can't recall that it was it was a big number we'll get back to it the other thing was we wanted to make sure that the flight that ended up being used was kind of benign obviously for everybody on board those flights i, I watched a couple of um whatever they call them like mini investigations where the youtuber goes through what happened and i'm sure for everyone on board those flights they're absolutely terrifying right when it's all shaking and everything's vibrating it's literally destroyed the cowling on the engine so i bet it was horrible however nobody died so in terms of just convenience there's two hours of uninterrupted everything's normal flight um and you know while we as was explained at the beginning going through this looking at whether or not has this been planted or dropped on us so that there's some glaring thing in there that's been altered that they want us to publish so we get in trouble because it's it's obviously very official stuff ntsb is no uh you know prime was like it's second only to the president well fine but yeah it's serious stuff if, if you're publishing stuff that's incorrect so we obviously went to by an extent to make sure that it was what it was but moreover you know we were very relieved when we we're reading through how they land the plane fine nobody's injured everybody's fine it just then goes to the ntsb because obviously it is a, a, an air failure that, that could have left people losing lives but it didn't so it's very useful for us it's got the right amount of time and as qe just said that time frame as you're looking at it you're like you could even wiggle a couple more minutes either side but there's absolutely without question two hours of data which just lines up so nicely with qe's original presentation it's fate like a glove i've just posted qe for the chat the ntsb um docket information so that lists all the documents um and there's a few bits there that will confirm what Nathan said about, you know, nobody died. We'd, we'd hate to have used that. Um, but if anybody wants to see the graphs and, and a lot more detail, you need to go to document number 11, click on view, and it'll open up the PDF in a web page for you. And all of that information is there. Um, and just in case, because I know I, this just happens to be a vague interest of mine, so I do happen to have, happen to have watched this particular air crash analysis before... I found out that this was the data we were using, so I happen to be quite knowledgeable, which isn't like me, about this particular air disaster. If I was watching this as an audience member, I'd want to know, well, what actually was the problem? You know, now you've talked about it. Well, the problem is that when you reach the size of the engines that they've reached, the efficiency versus power output that you can get from them at the size that they are gets to the peak where you know you go any bigger and you're losing efficiency and there's no point so it's it's every gram that they're fighting for to keep the weight down at that size of engine because they're huge things um, and in order to do that they've hollowed out the fan blades therefore they should and do you know look at them with x-rays and various different sonar techniques to check them for cracks because they're obviously weakened by the fact that they're no longer solid they're hollow and basically, one of these hollow fan blades had a crack in it, as has several of those engines. And if they fail, they fail in such a way that they completely obliterate the outside cowling. They used to before they were made of carbon reinforced steel or whatever it is, titanium or whatever it is they use now to replace the old, um, fairly flimsy aluminium that just got obliterated if a fan blade got thrown. As I say, the testament to the pilots, they've, they've you know, for figured out what was the right appropriate action. They've brought the plane down after this two hour window so that bit is only there just for you know historic see if you like so that people have an awareness of what this actually was and that nobody died therefore it's a very useful published public piece of information that we can utilize with peach data uh, and everything else that we could want alongside it it's, it's a glorious document in that regard um so yeah obviously it's a tragedy that people should go through that but it's not the end of the world in the most literal sense which is good for us Oh, yeah, I think that's an important point. There is, there was one death tonight. And yes, there was. Death. Oh. Yep, there was a. Yeah. I don't know about a disaster, but there was a death. This is for the Kent Fogamirians because we already knew this, didn't we? Yeah. If you just go up one, back up to the previous slide, a second, Kiwi. Thank you. What? That, that is the two-hour window. Uh, oh, sorry, Adam, do you want to say something as well? I just pointed out that this is the two-hour window that I thought QE had up. Um, 
uh, and it shows two errors where that black line or grey line that's below the orange pitch line there, that is zero degree. So that means that no point for that two errors was there any need to change in altitude because it shows the altitude holding constant as well along with the pitch. So for two hours at 500 miles an hour, this flight might travel a thousand miles. Everyone on board travel a thousand miles in a straight line. And if they, if we were on the globe, just won't just come back down to the next slide, please, Kibit. Uh, the one, thank you. If, if the Earth was a globe, that would mean they'd be 126 miles out of altitude. That's what that would mean. 126 miles. If you had to drive 126 miles and you were driving at 60 miles an hour, it would take you just over two hours to get there. That's the difference. And that's if you were going in a straight line. Go on. I thought you were. I'm just going to reiterate what you said at the end because you had such gusto. You gave me goosebumps. You know, there's no, there's no doubt about this. It's the last nail in the coffin. There has been a death. The globe is it. And Brian's right. There's no other way to explain this. The references on the graph, the graph itself, the pitch data. No, it's flat. Earth is flat. Now, for, just, just as a slightly comedic aside, there was a few people out there that said if we sent this data to Brian, he couldn't read it. Well, when Brian first got it, I don't know how long ago, in days, maybe let's say it's ten days ago, Brian sent it to me. Now, the cursory glance through it, picked out a graph and sent it back to him and went, right, there it is, Earth's flat. <laughs> and Brian got back into it, that's the wrong graph. <laughs> oh, yeah. had to, Brian had to take me through it and show me where the pitch data was because, admittedly, I did, didn't spend a great deal of time with it, but at a cursory glance, I didn't identify the correct graph. So where anybody was <laughs> saying, oh, Brian won't be able to read it. Well, no, I couldn't read it at a cursory glance and had to have it pointed out to me. By Brian, so that's on the record. He absolutely, without question, could read this. <laughs> Just so it's on the record, also. Difficult stuff, but you are colourblind. So the word in orange that said pitch, pitch. <laughs> I can imagine hard, hard to pick out. Um, yeah. There was there was one one other point before, and that that's what QE said. This is this is for the who QE, not ball chinians, what they're called. Can't can't fog a mir mirror. Can't fog a Marians. Yeah. You saw my presentation. It was in 2018. Yeah. I know, I've known this. I sat on the plane with the accelerometer. We've all known it. We know because, as we've outlined, the fundamentals of flight and how a plane stays in the air mean the only way to mitigate for flying over a curved spherical surface, i.e., a a presupposed ball earth is to have to change your pitch and reorientate you and however many miles you accumulate 14 degrees was my point <laughs> over that thousand point your plane is flying it's falling down tail first <laughs> yeah 14 degrees would be a uh, close on correct because it would be 7.25 degrees from the center of the globe of arc if you want to mean, like, I mean, it'd be 7.24 uh, 7 or 24 degrees, because that, that was the exact angle for 500 miles that they claim uh, Eratosthenes measured with the, with, with, when he subtracted his elevation angle and made it a zenith angle. Jeez. So it would be, yeah, just for a uh, close on 14 rate, degrees. Rate, rate of change of down, as I said earlier, was, is 0 0.009 degrees per kilometre. In terms of miles, it's 0 0.014 and some decimals per mile. Therefore, if you do a thousand miles, yep. that's 14 degrees. Now, before you get, before you get lost about in the, the numbers... Thing that... oh, no, 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 no. Just, just, just want to clarify. You, you've got... You, maths heads are on and it's, it's becoming convoluted. What are they talking about? They're talking about a colossal void opening up ahead of the plane. Isn't there... So we're all clear about these numbers that are just being thrown around. Yes, it's it's significant because what are they doing when they're maintaining level flight has been demonstrated by this pitch data. Uh, remaining uh, horizontal and parallel with the surface, which is not falling away. It's not opening up a massive void. And the void that isn't opening up ahead of them, obviously, is what's being described now. Feel free to continue. When, yeah, when well, earlier, well, just people to... wouldn't be sitting back in their seats towards the end of the presentation. This is the other point. You can either have this massive void or you can drop in altitude and trim and stuff like this. 
but you, unless you reorientate yourself, you accumulate it. So the point that the on a 747 where your standard um, uh, pitch angle, as demonstrated, this is around right about the three to five degree mark, as demonstrated with the data we've finally got, as I recorded, what I'm saying is over this thousand years, if you didn't get the altitude, what you'd have to do is accumulate 14 degrees, meaning your pitch angle towards the end of that two hour period will be 17 degrees. Look at the graph. <laughs> it, it yeah, does but not do there's that. certain points it's I need there. to point out here. So. Quickly. Just, just right. agree with Adam. Yes, and it's not there. I, I, I don't want to disagree with you, but it's just the way you phrased it. It just rubbed me the wrong way slightly. When you're like, it, it could either adjust by 14 degrees. It isn't, though, is it? <laughs> no. So it's not happening. Yeah. But the, the reason it's not is because it, they can't because of the lift effect yep. makes it impossible. Yep. So even that first 0.09 degrees of a degree, 0.09 or point no, whatever, 9 of a degree or 1.4 of a degree, right? That initial one, that would have to be below horizontal. Yep. They're already flying with a couple of degrees below above horizontal. So they'd have to take away those completely and start off with horizontal, then gradually be below horizontal. And that would mean they're gradually losing all lift. Yep. yep. Sort of falling out of the sky. Yep. And you're either the only other thing I'd like to say, Helen, um, uh, this is important. Sorry. Go on, one second. Adam said they could drop an altitude by pulling back the power and whatever and yeah for a small amount of time they can they could do something like if you want to get into fantasy you could try and now they don't do that you could say they could try to do something like that but that won't work either because the orientation of the plane after a while will end up if you fly long enough uh, i'm feeding back on someone yeah some, there. grab somebody in discord uh, in. yeah Right. Does. That, so what happened to the point, Brian, start again because this is a really important point and it relates to QE's point. And it's again, it's a laughable point. If you, when you follow it to conclusion, what's going to happen if they only deal with just QE's point, the, 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 this addresses it. So go on, you can yeah. trim airspeed. Go on. Yeah, let's just say if they kept pulling back on the power and and they weren't changing their pitch and they kept on just dropping downwards. What will happen is, because they have to keep an above horizontal pitch, above that same horizontal, that means every line they fly has to be parallel to each other at that point. So every time they drop, they still have to, it's like go from one step on the stairs to the next step on the stairs to the next step on the stairs. But when you go around a, a convex surface, what will happen is, if you're flying from London to Perth or something like that, what's going to happen is you'll end up, when you get to Perth, you'll be vertical over the airport. <laughs> the, tail, right? the tail of the airplane will be down, will be pointed. See, the whole, see, you get into absolute craziness at that point, and you can't hold an attitude. None of it works. Right? No matter, that is, like, it's just so no, convoluted. Right, right. And not, right. Yeah, go on. Right. If, 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 if I'm flying at 500 miles an hour, and after that first minute, I accumulate so much accumulated drop, Right. So to mitigate for it, just just every minute I trim by five miles an hour. What speed am I going after an hour? Do you understand? Yep. You, uh, and then yeah. at what point can I no longer mitigate for the accumulated altitude gained by just traversing a ball before I fall out the air? <laughs> you can't. We, we This is why yeah. we described how aeroplanes work. For a purpose, followed this this point. Oh, you just just trim your airspeed a bit, and you'll fall out. Lovely. Keep doing that, and you'll hit the deck <laughs> after a short journey, won't you? And everyone will know it. it. And every exactly. everyone, every soul on that aircraft will know it. Duh. Every single sob on that plane. Good. Oh, okay, do you want to come on with the next section? Yes. The, the next section might seem a little bit petty, but I, I have to go through it. And the reason I have to go through it is because I was told things that were not true by people on the opposing side. So, this is Trevor Austin. Now, I don't particularly want to point out and attack Trevor Austin too much, but unfortunately, I have two comments from Trevor. Um, because the reason I don't want to hack him too much is he's not my main 
my main source of attack, my main source of attack is coming after him, the two people after him. But, because he, he has hung around, even when certain other supposed commercial pilots have disappeared, right? He's hung around and he's argued with me. Now, he's, he's since I started bringing up Lyft and a few other things with him, gradually he's become a little bit nastier with me and different things like that. He used to wish me happy Christmas. That doesn't happen anymore, let's just say. But I have a couple of comments here from him, right, that I'm going to read out. So, yes, Brian, right, from Trevor Austin. He's 30 years, uh, 30 years as a commercial pilot, but he's retired, he says. Yes, Brian, pitch data is reality. In the cruise with nothing moving, it will be a constant value over a short period of time. The reference will, from the local vertical, the, the reference will, from the local vertical, angle of attack data will be measured typically from, but not always, the cord line. It, it, it too will remain fairly constant. So no pitching down, just as you don't have to lean forward a little bit more to walk. <laughs> right? Thank you. So, Welcome to Flat Earth, yeah. Trevor. Welcome to Flat Earth. That, yeah. that, that is frustrating, isn't it? That's a deceiver right there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, if you're walking forwards, you and you were walking over a, a, a curving spherical surface, you would have to reorientate yep. what was down. The the second you've taken a few, just imagine on you know, just walking on top of a dome, the second you've walked ten or fifteen feet down has changed. Now, the purpose of of the reason I bored you with the video is, well, down doesn't change for the gyroscope. It doesn't change to the artificial horizon, guys. Exactly. So this is yeah, exactly Adam. But what this is is that this is this commercial pilot not being able to just be honest with me or with himself. But the problem is is that he has been honest with me up to a point in what he's saying, but he's trying to then change history. It's like in his in his comment, he's literally trying to change history. Within the same comment. So if I go on to the next one, please, QE, which is from him again. This is a more lengthy, lengthy one, right? So I'll have to read it out. But this is a more recent one as well. <clears throat> I'll say this is on a different video or whatever. So Trevor Austin, right? All I have ever done is mock your stubborn refusal to entertain the thought that you could ever be wrong, right? This is what he's saying to me. In return, you have regularly called me a lawyer, a bozo, ignorant, and stupid. That's true. <laughs> Uh, is that reasonable regarding flight data? I have always refused point blank to give you any data. I've also given you the reasons why, so let me reinstate them again. I did call him those names, but only after he started being completely dishonest. Right? Up to that point, I wasn't calling him those names. Only after... So we, well, wait a second. Only after, only after he lied, been a bozo, ignorant and stupid. Did you call him that, right? Yes. It's, it's just <laughs> yes. The score. Just carry on. Yeah, I just wanted to throw it out there, right? So number one, for his first reason, flight data is not for public consumption. Well, that's obviously well, right. obviously Why? false. <laughs> yes, obviously false. Why, question mark? Firstly, agreements with pilot, pilot unions preclude its dissemination. Uh, dissemination. Secondly, I do not believe any airline will release any flight data, hmm. and certainly not to prove the shape of the earth. They would argue that the existence, the, that they would argue, so he's speaking for them now, that the existence charts of the Earth published timetables, freely available aircraft performance data, that would be what we just showed, and live online aircraft tracking over the, the entire planet, begging the question, will demonstrate that the Earth's shape is known. I work for airlines for 30 years, and they work hard at maintaining their reputation. They will not be associated with proving the shape of the Earth. Two, oh, yeah. oh yes, they of, will. <laughs> yes, they will. They just have been. <laughs> Two, pitch data will prove nothing. <laughs> really? Because how could it not prove something? It would be impossible for pitch data. That was the whole point of the pitch data challenge is that it either proves or disproves that the earth is a globe. And it proves it's flat. End of story. That's what it does. So pitch data okay. will prove nothing okay. is a hand wave. Right. Go on. Again, this is important, and hence why I introduced the gyroscope, to deny this point. Hence why I talked about the path of the aeroplane as a vector. Hence why I set out to measure what vectors it would travel. 
yeah and to see if it would reorientate to anything that was it was changing it was uh, based on its traversement over it yeah it's not there and to make this point to claim that the pitch data won't prove anything and um, would be to have to claim that gravity affects gyroscope something that is in deniance of the effect of a gyroscope this is why they they're all ends up this is why people have to lie and say the pitch data wouldn't prove anything if it didn't why have we been desperate for what six years yeah. or more seven years or more you know this is the thing we've been after from an authoritative source not just me with my accelerometers I actually get this because once we had it it will prove something it will show you what the aeroplane is traversing over either a plane or a spherical surface yes sir seen what it exactly exactly and this why, why, this is... saying, why would you say well, wouldn't prove anything no if you if you're going we already know it's a ball the airlines know it's a ball we wouldn't associate this data with anything that's going to be proving uh, earth but it wouldn't prove anything anyway it's like well if you're of the belief that it's a ball surely everything measurement wise ever will prove it's a ball yep there won't be any exceptions if it's a ball everything will prove it's a ball right no what does it prove them telling you it won't prove anything well it proves it's flat yep well that, that when he says it doesn't prove anything, that's exactly it it means it won't prove the globe it will disprove the globe and that's the problem so when he says that number two here pitch data will prove nothing right that's what he's saying yeah, and he continues on to say, if a flat earth had gravity and an atmosphere, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, that matched reality, right, whatever the hell that means, then an aircraft will also prove that something like plus two to plus two, five, plus five degrees of pitch, just as you claim. If flight data ag agreed with your pitch claim, would the world be flat? Yes. Yeah. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> he puts in, of course not. <laughs> and then he continues on. That is because you have not taken the biggest factor into account. Little G, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you little goober. Right. <laughs> yeah, L little G, which has nothing, which has no bearing on lift and the lift effect. Right. Right. Whatever. And this is that's, the problem. Go on. That's Adam. not what he's saying. That, that this is my point. This is what they invoke here. They're trying to claim that gravity realigns gyroscopes. Now, <laughs> set your gyroscope up, twist it, see if it realigns. Due to no, it doesn't, does it? Yeah. The, this is what I'm saying. To to make this point, they have to um, discredit the point that gyroscopes hold their position in free space. Yep. Which is why. Pilots, when they realized when they were flying in clouds and they couldn't see what they were doing, think of thought, how can I make sure I keep this horizontal when I can't see the horizon anymore? So what they do, took, did was take this principle of gyroscopes that will maintain that horizontal for them. So when they can't see the horizon, it's still there. <laughs> hey, Trevor, yeah. Trevor, Trevor Austin, uh, with all due respect, sir, you're a putt. Yeah, but see, this is the thing, right? Like, this is why I point out the, the lift effect, and this is why this is where this is coming from, because I'm bringing up the lift effect constantly. Uh, the point being is that is that he with the lift effect, you can't horizontal as an orientation can't change, right? The pitch of horizontal in relation to a different horizontal is <laughs> doesn't exist. All, horizontal, all pitch is determined from horizontal. It's a constant. Like vertical is a constant. There is no changing of it. There's no diverging vertical. The same way as no, there is no diverging horizontals. It doesn't exist. Right? So pitch makes what he's saying impossible. Because what he's talking about there would mean that the airplane would have to pitch below its original horizontal. From the get-go. From the moment it reaches cruising altitude it can have an above horizontal yeah. pitch it must at that exact moment start having an accumulated below horizontal pitch yeah hit number so three that didn't start. yes sir but, hit number three let's go yeah but that's my, what my point is is that my point is is that you can't do this yeah. not accepting this fact means that it 
that it is pointless you having the data. So he doesn't want to give me the data. But we, we've established that. Number three, no airline I know would be prepared to spend the time and effort to, to extract the pitch data and replace time and date with a relative time block. <laughs> You sure? <laughs> <laughs> We've just shown that we will. <laughs> foot, foot, meat, mouth. <laughs> yeah. Don't laugh at this. This is a deceiver. You've said it already. I know we've said it at the beginning, but we brush past it and laugh at it now, like it's laughable. But it is. It's deceit. Yeah. Yeah. And these these uh, are desperate, desperate attempts to show that why the pitch data wouldn't mean anything, even if you could. And it has been hard to get. So these first points, you might have thought, well, yeah, they are hiding it for a reason. Um, but not for the reasons he said, because as we've demonstrated, they're out there. They are actually in public domain, thanks to I think it's book Sodbuster. Um, we've been made aware of that. And now we're aware that that's what makes this guy laughable. It's there. And so it doesn't, what, what did he say? In an effort to extract the pitch date and replace time and date with a relative time block. What do, I don't even know what that means. That's what we just did. <laughs> yeah. It means that they won't do, they won't ever create the very thing that we've just read that they created. <laughs> right. So, so, so let's, let's read it again. No airline I know will be prepared to spend time and effort to extract the pitch data and replace time and date with a relative time block. Unless of the course in the uh, occurrence of something like a, uh, engine failure yep. made air where an investigation report would extract all of that and put it in a time block as we've just shown yes. that response yeah it's in the flight data recorder obviously uh, yeah so no airline i know so all the airlines in the incidents of an engine exploding in an accident report needing to be uh, submitted would have to do exactly what he says no airline i know would be prepared to do Yep. He's, he's, yes. he's, you're right, Brian. He, 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 that is just pure deceit. It is. It is, absolutely. And he continues or on. Or yeah. ignorance. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I, I can't claim ignorance for him because he's a commercial pilot, so exactly. he has to know that. Yeah, he, yeah. he would have to know that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the continuum on, he continues on, he says, that does not mean such data cannot be obtained. Large corporate jets have the same quick access recorders as airlines, if they agree, I f if they agreed, I feel they would quite rightly charge you for the data and also prohibit public distribution. Right? They prefer to remain discreet about their operations. I would expect a charge of several thousand dollars for each for for such data. Right. The same would apply to aircraft manufacturers. Right? He that, finishes that's up with the saying, point. Yeah, come on. Well, if it proved the ball wouldn't it be out there? Yep. Yeah. Why yes. would they prefer to remain discreet? Well, all these these this this excuses he's given as to why it's just not freely available are nonsensical. Yep. They're, yeah. it's, it's these are moronic theatrics. They're no, I'll describe them. They're mor moronic theatrics. That's what this is right here. This is a nothing burger of idiocy, Trevor. Welcome to Flat yeah, Earth, it, by it, the way. Exactly, because this next line will really show it. Because all he's doing there is coming up with reasons, trying to get me away from ever getting this data. I wonder why. So the last line says, your way out is just to declare that it is quite feasible for an aircraft in cruise to hold and maintain an average pitch value of, say, 3 point, plus 3.5 degrees for several hours. <laughs> I won't argue. I'll even put my name on it. There we are. It's official. Now what? Welcome to it's Flat Earth. Earth. Yeah, that's what I wrote to him, if I remember correctly. That was my response. It's like he's even stating himself that an average pitched out of 3 to 3.5 degrees, which would probably be around average for most flights, a commercial flight. He's literally stating, yeah, I put my name on it. As a 30-year as a, as a commercial pilot, I put my name on it. Yeah, that's what happens. What does that mean? It means it's flat. That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> it can't uh, mean anything else. Uh, officially there, Trevor. Welcome to Flat yeah. Earth. Beep. Beep. I don't, don't, don't well, anticipate. Right. Don't. Okay, just move on. On to the next one. We'll leave Trevor go with that, please, Kiwi. Oh, God, Wolfie. Right. 
Now, we must address him, right? Why I'm addressing him is the comment I wanted from him is actually saved on my computer with the broken screen, so I can't read it. I can't see it, I can't get to it, and it won't connect to the TV so, or, or the monitor, and I can't even get it to connect because I can't even see what I'm doing. So there's not, it's just a pure black screen, but I know it's on there. Right? When I have the screen fixed, I can get it. And I have it somewhere in the comment section on one of my videos, but as everyone knows, I have, have probably thousands of one red comments and thousands of red comments. And to find this comment, I just wasn't able to do it. Right. But this particular comment is a comment from Wolfie TV, one of many, many comments from him in this vein. Brian, there is no point until you acknowledge you suffer from a disability that prevents you from understanding math and geometry correctly. <laughs> Explaining why you are wrong is like trying to explain colors to a blind person. You just won't see your mistakes as your brain is faulty, Brian. Our model is solid and your lack of understanding won't change that. So this is from a guy. Right, who's around since 2016. I remember when he first turned up. That means he's, he's, he was the first person I came at for the pitch data because he was the biggest mouth. Right. He, and this is several years ago, and other people have asked him for I know Flatside has asked him for it, and maybe others. The point being is that he has spent eight years not getting that pitch data. The very data we showed earlier. Eight years he spent not getting it. Right. Eight years avoiding that data because he knew what it would show, what it would show. And every time I said to him, you won't get the data because you know what it will show, right? He won't have anything to do with it. He won't give me any kind of proper reply or anything, right? Or oh, you don't understand or this, that, and the other thing. He won't, he will not, he will not address pitch data. And when I started bringing up lift, the lift effect, he eventually stopped coming to my channel on his main, cha uh, coming to my channel on his main account and started coming on his secondary account. So anything that he says that might go wrong on him, it doesn't come out on his main account and it doesn't, and he can always deny that that second account is his because he was saying so many stupid things, right? So oh, this yeah. guy here, just let me finish, one second, right, Alan. This guy here, Wolfie, told me, and this is a comment I don't have, but I can, I can get it. He told me it would cost possibly 100,000 right, euros or whatever to get the pitch data. For that to be got could be ridiculous money, and it'd be very lucky if I ever got it, right? What a load of lies this man has told for eight years. Go on, Adam. And why? Because, as you said, two pilots, yeah? Uh, it was, And the thing is, that date was there. If it had approved anything, it had been all over their channels, wouldn't it? Proving you're navigating a ball. Now, I just want... I know QA hates the word model, but these are Wolfie's words. Our model is solid. <laughs> Your lack of understanding won't change that. Yeah, right. Now, if we were to just accept the word model in its colloquial sense, within your model to maintain altitude and traverse over a ball, it requires your aeroplane to reorientate because... As you move over your supposed ball, your supposed direction of gravity changes, your numpties. Now, Wolfie, your model is solid, a bit like the wood between your ears, I think. <laughs> but like by your kid. own words. Like, uh, but by your own petard, <laughs> you're undone. And this is the point of the presentation. By your own model, your own claims of how you would have to go around the ball your pitch data demonstrates that's not how the aero plane behaves. Exactly. Uh, and I, I apologise to everyone that I don't have the comment where he's stating the cash, but it does matter, I can get it. He has avoided getting, I have no end of comments from him, avoiding me addressing him about pitch data, not just on my channel, but on other on other channels, and I've made vid specific videos about the pitch data, and specifically him, right? He refused for eight years to get that pitch data. Eight years, he could have come up with that eight years ago, right? Because he, him, and Trevor Austin, and any other commercial pilot, right, who claims to be, who claims it's a globe, they're all fully aware of NTSB and the like. They're all totally aware of it. They have to be as part of their job. You can't, it's like being a bus driver and not being aware uh, not being aware of the procedure that happens when you crash into a car. 
you know what I mean? You have to know those things. You know, it's stupid. But let's bring this on to the next, like, let's, let's bring this on to the present day QE with the last comment. Thank you. You can zoom in on that if you can or if you want it. But this is from the final experiment, right? Will Duffy, right? I made a video, right, for Will Duffy some while ago. Now, I was under the pretense from hearing from Wolfie and Trevor Austin, mainly Wolfie, that it would cost thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands to get pitched at, right? And I heard about Will Duffy, I heard, listened to Will Duffy, and he basically stated that he wanted to pay money for truth, right? And he was interested in proving whether the earth was a globe or the earth was flat. So I made a video, and in my video, I stated to Will Duffy, I stated, uh, well, if you don't go to Antarctica, if you just pay for the pitch data for from two or three get it from two or three uh, reputable airlines. Not, not the, I'm just saying the, the more reputable, the, the better, like Lufthansa, whatever. Right? Pay for it. Then nobody needs to go, go to Antarctica. No one can fall off the ice wall. There'll be no shenanigans and no nonsense. Nobody needs to leave their family or do any nonsense. You'll have a lot less headaches, a lot less uh, uh, insurance headaches, and you won't have to travel there. The pitch data will show and prove where the Earth is flat or the Earth is a globe. Right? This is what he sent me back after I, I, I sent him a LinkedIn video and I, I just gave him a quick outline of the video. But, uh, but he, right, he says to me, hey, thanks for reaching out. I will watch your video on one condition, that you agree that a 24-hour sun in Antarctica will falsify the A.E. Gleason map, which is a pro map. Right? <laughs> right? Right? Look forward to your reply, Will. Right? Right? Now, I, how stupid it is that... It, He's saying it'll falsify a globe map, right? That's stupid <laughs> as, as a start, right? right? That's right. what I'm laughing the, at. I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> I wanted to laugh as well. But the thing is, is that before we make too much of a joke of it, this guy is fully aware of what's in my video team, right? Have no doubt. Without him say, him, he, right, without him, uh, without him watching it, right? He's fully aware of what's in it. He's fully, he's definitely heard about it have no doubt and that's why he came up with this condition so instead of watching the video and coming back to me with something even if he said he wasn't going to do it at least watch it and come back to me he came up with some rubbish condition instead of doing it and the reason he did is because he's not interested in paying money for truth he's interested in pushing some other agenda i don't know what it is but he's up to some nonsense but what i do know and can say for certain and definitely know can show and prove what we now have to pitch that that this guy is a total and utter fraud. Because if he was interested in actually proving where the Earth is flat or the Earth is a globe, he wouldn't be going to Antarctica to see whatever nonsense is going to happen in the sky at a certain time of year. Right? He would have changed away from that and gone with the pitch data. That's what he would have done. Because the pitch data proves that it's flat. But no, he'll have nothing to do with it. Because he has some other agenda. Don't know what it is. All I know is that this is the reason I'm even bringing him up is because the pitch data argument directly ties into him right now, and he's very current. End of presentation. Know, Thank you. That was o- almost end. It's, I don't know. That's a great point to bring Will Duffy in there. Nathan will like this because fundamentally he's assuming the consequent has now been destroyed. Yeah, because he would try to assume that over a thousand miles there'd be a 14 degree change in antipodal positioning. We've just demonstrated with the pitch date there is no. So whatever you see in Antarctica, one sun, Chinook suns, doesn't really matter because what we've demonstrated with the pitch data, pasta, as Brian tried to show you, save you money, just get the pitch data, is you're not going to generate an antipodal position, which requires non-parallel downs, diverging zeniths. The pitch data demonstrates that isn't occurring. Over the two-hour period that QE sites and I referenced, yeah, Brian describes. So you're done, mate. No need to go down south because whatever you see, it's not going to be antipodal. Can I officially end it? Absolutely. Do you like to join the Discord, QE Live? This is the official end of the Globetard.
Thank you for joining. Have a nice day. <laughs> that was like a minute silence. <laughs> About time. Yeah, no way back. No way back. No way out. Hey, it's funny to see what's going on while I'm working in an airport. We've known this forever. It's just the end of a trail where we've been stating this as evidentiary for a long time. Kiwi's had this presentation for a long while. So has Brian. So has Adam. Now we've got the pitch data. It's a punctuation mark to the point that's been made consistently. Well, as uh, Adam just pointed out, every time anybody now tries to make an antipodal assumption in regards to the surface of Earth, if you're travelling on it via, via plane, then you're travelling on it flat. If you're traveling on it by a boat, we expanded the territories, then you're navigating it flat. If you're building on it, you're building on it flat. Earth's flat. Just one more yeah. nail in the coffin. They're literally, it's like, I mean, air travel, there's more measurements of flat earth made every day by air travel than any other system, whether it be uh, navigation by sea, land, or, uh, or uh, surveying, nothing. I mean, you're talking thousands of miles, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles a day are traversed by, our, by commercial airliners alone, never mind smaller or other air, air, aircraft. And all of that, it's all measured. It's all, it's all straight line measurements, two-dimensional two, two measurements. No way out. Take us home, Nathan. That huge, massive, enormous thank you to... Not just our illustrious host QE, but obviously Adam and Brian for making today's presentation and information possible. Huge thank you to all of you for smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting QE up on PayPal and Patreon and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley. Massive thank you to the, all the other Ballbusters, and we'll see you all in the next Ballbusters.